everybody and welcome to NJDEP's fifth annual HAB Summit. We are so excited to have all of you here today. We have an extremely packed agenda for you. Um, my name is Chelsea Brook and I work in the Assistant Commissioner's Office for Water Resource Management and I'm going to be your moderator for today. Just a few ground rules before we get started. As I said, we have an extremely packed agenda, so I'm not going to go over um, and introduce everybody's full biographies. I've added that to the chat. I encourage you to go and read them um, as well to check out the agenda. Um, so. It, as as it is a long day, we understand some of you may be coming and going throughout the day. That's absolutely OK. Uh, we just, you know, strongly urge you to mute yourself before you come and go. Make sure that you're muted throughout the day. Additionally, because we have so much on uh, <laughs> for today, we're going to leave the chat for most of the Q&A. We will have a few sections where, you know, you will be able to, to ask live questions. You can use the raise, raise your hand function. Um, but for the most part, we're gonna rely on that chat today to really keep the day moving. Um, so I also wanna point out, there is a little button in the top left hand corner of the toolbar and it is take control. Please stay away from that button. That is for our presenters to go back and share um, control for when they're presenting the slides. I know, I know, buttons can be really hard to to not hit, but please don't hit that one unless you are a presenter trying to take control. Um, so, with that, if there are any questions again throughout, just put them in the chat. Whether it's you know how the day is going, um, or if it's a specific question regarding topic, that's that's your spot. Um, we will have a lunch break at, from 12 to 1 today. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Commissioner Katie Angarone. All right. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Chelsea. And thank you for the ground rules about the button. Who knew? Who knew? Um, welcome to the fifth annual Harmful Algal Bloom Summit. I cannot believe that it has been five years um, when we when we started this. Uh, you know, the state's been tracking harmful algal blooms, HABs, since 2017. And in 2019, we did hold our first um, HAB summit. We did it in person in two parts of the state. And that was part of the governor's harmful algal bloom initiative. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if many of you remember the A-team, but I think about this quote, I love it when a plan comes together. Um, and if you don't remember that, my apologies, uh, you are younger than I am. Um, but boy, has this HAB initiative, it was our plan and it came together. So by way of reminder, our charge was to do three things. The first was to take action to prevent HABs. And we have. We've spent millions through various funding sources to plan, prevent, and mitigate HABs. And you'll hear about uh, some of those projects, in particular a demonstration project right here in Mercer County today, and what we can learn from it. Um, and we were also meant to enhance the science and build capacity to respond. And again, today you'll hear about our annual strategy, how we reevaluate it to make sure we're still spot on and using the best science. You'll learn about the lessons we've learned and the new emerging threats, uh, which is essentially the groundwater connection. Um, you'll also hear about funding opportunities and the role of local partners, which is essential and I cannot um, uh, under, uh, overstate enough. And finally, the governor asked us to improve communication through tools, local government assistance, um, and, and also this very annual summit. So you'll hear about our lake manager's guidance today, uh, some pretty amazing tools uh, built by partners outside the agency as well as in. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll, you're here today for the summit. So check, check, check. I think we've done a great job. And fast forwarding to today, we have so much more data. Some of it is a little depressing. Uh, good science in New Jersey tells us that the, the conditions that favor HABs with climate change are going to continue to worsen but we're also smarter and savvier and as a community i think we are more connected than ever we are collaborating learning sometimes failing but always coming back smarter in fact it kind of reminds me of the uh the t-shirt my daughter came home from her sixth grade science fair with uh, test fail repeat and that is how we get better 
And we are doing it all together because I believe that this community in particular, the folks who attend this uh, summit, uh, understand that even though HAB prevention and understanding the science and communicating clearly is an investment of our money and our time, our water is worth it. So we all play our roles. Managing our water is quite literally, I believe, all of our jobs. It does not fall to one group or one level of government. It's the people in this room in particular who get that. And I thank you for that. Watershed management is what prevents HABs. From your backyard to our town halls, decisions about what vegetation to plant, how to manage your roof runoff, your local ordinances, the way you pres uh, preserve land or even pave your roads, each decision that we are all making determines our water quality. Water that we recreate in, that our local businesses rely on, that you drink, and that can flood in an instant if you don't manage it appropriately. So our role as a state here at DEP is to help you do what you do best for your community, to help you protect those water resources that we all hold in trust for the public. And we uh, here, we, we do this with technical assistance, funding tools, and all of it that we can muster, honestly. And we're passionate about bringing you the most current science and data and having you bring it to us too. And we're thankful for our partners who do that. Uh, we even support you with regulatory reform. I know it seems painful at first, but I have I've heard enough belated thank yous to know that we can get through to the other side of new regulation um, and and it usually works. It does what we intend it to. But collaboration truly is the only way to solve these complex problems uh, like HABs, which are going to get even more challenging with climate change. So. I want to thank uh, the fine folks who begin in December to pull this summit together every year. And thanks to the excellent speakers. There are too many to name. As Chelsea said, their bios are in the chat. Please take a look. Um, and we'll hear from all of them today and we'll learn and we'll share. And I'm looking forward to that. But most of all, I want to thank you for showing up and taking your role in protecting New Jersey's water resources so seriously. Spread the word that this work belongs to all of us because our water is worth it. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, so next up, we have we are really excited that we have two keynote speakers for you um, that are coming to us from EPA to give us a taste of what's happening on the national level. So first up is Brannon Walsh from the Office of Water. Brandon? Hey, good morning, Katie. Katie, I have a slight technical difficulty. Uh, I joined with the link that uh, was sent out, but I'm unable to share, apparently. Hold on, and let me see if I can bring up. If you if you can shoot me the correct link for presenters, I can I can jump out and jump back in very quickly. It should be the same link. Do you want me to just pull your slides up for you? That'll work too. Okay. Let me make sure this, hold on one second. Yeah, it's telling me only meeting organizers and presenters can share. Okie dokie. There you go. Can you see them? Uh, not yet. Oh, okay, it's a little delayed. I see them on my end. Let me know no when you. No problem. All right, there they are. Okay. You just have to let me know next slide. <laughs> sure thing, and I and I apologize. I don't know why that's happening. All right. Well, I, I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you uh, for the opening remarks and thanks for the invitation. Again, I'm Brannon um, and I'm I'm grateful to have the opportunity to, to talk with this group about the EPA National Hab program. So I'm I'm gonna go through a little bit of background on the program. Uh, I want to give you a, a sense of the the types of HAB activities that we have going on at the agency. Um, note some emerging 
topics of interest and, and also make you aware of the information tools and resources that we have available on HABs. You know, it looks like I can navigate. So I might be able to change these. Do you want to try yes, doing the takeover at the so that I, I said, don't anybody touch that button, but you can t touch that button. Does it give you the option in the upper left hand corner to take over? It, in the in the toolbar? It does not. Oh, wait, here we go. There you go. Yep. All right, are you guys seeing slide two then? Yep. Great. OK, so uh, the National HAB program uh, is freshly minted. Um, this was formally established just this past summer in July of 2023 and includes representatives from all four of EPA's water programs. Uh, from criteria to permits, as well as the Office of Research and Development and the 10 EPA regional offices. So Michael Paul is the national program lead. Uh, I know he was hoping to be here today, but unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, if you haven't already, hopefully you'll have an, an opportunity to, to work with Mike in the future. Mike is largely responsible for the, the heavy lifting and getting the the program up and running and established over the last year. And the objective of the program is to serve as a center for coordination of HAB's work across the agency. Um, the ultimate goal, I think, to help us do a better job providing technical guidance and support on these issues. So you all being in Region 2, are in great hands with Michael Flood as your, your HABs coordinator, who serves as your, your point of contact uh, for this program and, and for what's really a, a sizable community of, of HAB researchers and practitioners at EPA, uh, but also a, a large body of, of information and, and resources that you can tap into. So much of what the National HAB program is focused on is outreach and disseminating information. This is largely done through our Harmful Algal Blooms website, which was just recently revamped, and I, I encourage you to go explore. Uh, you'll find EPA HAB related work as well as state and tribal information there organized across these five main activity areas that you see on the left side of the slide. So including prevention, monitoring, uh, forecasting control as well as response activities and I want to just walk through each of these to give you a sense of the type of work that we have going on there. So in terms of prevention one of the the major activities that EPA undertakes is the development of advisories and criteria for HAB toxins. We have values for for microcystin uh, and cylinder spermopsin both drinking water, health advisories, and, and recreational criteria. We're also in the process of, of working on similar efforts for both anatoxin and saxitoxin with hope of updates on those in 2025. I want to note the, the state and tribal HAB monitoring programs and resources page shown there uh, where we, we give a uh, table of toxin thresholds that have been adopted by, by state and tribal partners for for both microcystin and cylindro, but also for, for other HAB toxins. And, and these are thresholds that are being used for advisory decisions, uh, which I think it's always nice to know what your, your neighbors are up to on these issues. Nutrient pollution being a, a major contributor to HABs, our nutrient criteria program has a vast number of, of resources, um, tools, data, and information available to support efforts to curb nutrient pollution. Uh, these in include resources for both criteria development, but also some more HAB-specific preventative measures, uh, biological, chemical, physical, uh, that have been compiled by states and other collaborators. And this example is, is taken from the, the Interstate Technology Regulatory Council, or, or ITRC, reports on cyanobacteria uh, that do a, a thorough job on these methods and you'll you'll see those described and, and linked at the website as well. Moving on to monitoring, uh, we've got a strong set of monitoring resources at EPA that are, are led by teams out of the Office of Research and Development and also the Office of Wetlands, Oceans and Watersheds 
And these include the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network application, or Cyan app, which is a, a collaborative effort between a handful of federal agencies to stand up a satellite-based monitoring tool that provides near real-time HAB monitoring information for 2,200 of the, the largest lakes and reservoirs in the U.S. And work is currently underway on some next generation Cyan tools to integrate more uh, higher resolution satellite imagery and allow us to monitor smaller lakes and reservoirs and, and hopefully expand that monitored lake population um, upwards to something like 300,000 in the near future. So some pretty exciting stuff to come on Cyan. In addition to Cyan, we, we have the National Aquatic Resource Surveys, uh, including the National Lakes Assessment that's shown here, that all collect algal composition information as well as HAB toxin data, uh, gives us a, a way of, of estimating um, the extent of waters nationwide that are impacted. And also want to mention our, our participatory or volunteer monitoring programs, which include Bloomwatch, uh, which is part of the, the Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative. And through the Bloomwatch app, volunteers and, and interested groups can, can report HABs wherever they encounter them, can upload photos, uh, collect water samples. There's, there's opportunities to access microscopes and, and even send in samples for toxin analysis through that. So that's been a, a very popular and successful program. So one of the emerging topics of interest um, for monitoring is improving data centralization. Uh, I mentioned the Bloomwatch app. There are updates impending on Bloomwatch that will stream that information into the water quality portal, uh, which is a central hub for federal and state water quality data. And I think we're excited to get more of that information into uh, the hands of the, the public and, and, and uh, uh, facilitate analysis of that alongside those, those other data sets. And similarly, we're hoping to do some centralization around HAB advisory information. This map in the, the lower right on the slide is taken from our website. We've got a, a HAB story map that tracks all of the publicly available HAB advisories across the country. Uh, currently reporting on that is a little bit spotty, and, and we're in the process of, of looking into how we might adapt Bloomwatch for that purpose as well. And I also just want to note that we're we're in conversation with CDC um, to see if this or or something similar might be a good platform for uh, tracking human and animal hab related illnesses. So moving into forecasting, uh, EPA has been using the cyan data for a variety of of research and analysis, uh, conducting. Um, uh, constructing models for for predicting risk of of occurrence of HABs and HAB toxins uh, and Amalia Handler's work on the bottom right there. Um, and more recently, Blake Schaefer and, and other researchers have been working to develop some some forecasting functionality to complement the the cyan monitoring data. Those forecasts were were just published in the, the Journal of Environmental Management. And our next step is to to work to make those routinely available. So those teams are, are working hard to operationalize those new forecasts. Uh, we're hoping that we can get these out for the next HAB season. So spinning up pretty quick here in the next couple of months. Um, those seven day forecast of HAB events uh, for the Cyan Lake population are gonna be served up through the How's My Waterway app as well as the Cyan desktop app. And the, the hope is that once we, we get to a place where that next generation Cyan work is completed and, and we can expand to that larger universe of, of 300,000 lakes, we'll be able to um, expand this forecasting functionality as well. So pretty cool stuff to come there. We also have quite a bit of work on control technologies. A uh, big focus at EPA has been on methods for uh, detecting and controlling HABs and drinking water treatment systems. Um, Teams have been working on, on a number of cutting edge methods for, for toxin detection specifically. We've got a lot of information on that um, and folks are working to, to update and expand on those. Uh, currently, you'll find a lot of information on the, on the website about that. 
In addition to drinking water treatment, uh, we've got some examples of HAB control technologies for surface waters, and we've got links to a large uh, network of information on, on in situ water body control technologies. I mentioned the, the, the ITRC reports, um, and you'll see, you'll see those linked and discussed there as well. The control technology arena uh, has been an area, uh, area of interest for our federal partners too. Uh, U.S. Army Corps in particular has been funding and continues to fund research initiatives on these technologies. And we, uh, along with NOAA and, and others, have been collaborating on those efforts uh, in the hope that we'll, we'll have some safe and effective control technologies that will come out of these projects. So some potential things to look for in the future there. Lastly, I want to mention some resources we have on HAB event response, uh, the cornerstone of which is our, our cyanotoxin preparedness and response toolkit, which provides a, a step by step guide for developing HAB management response plans. Um, much of this information has has grown out of, of regional and state experience in, in, in dealing with some of the, the large HAB events of late um, you know, Salem, Oregon and Toledo, Ohio and others. And uh, I think this information has been quite useful for states. Um, you'll, you'll find some expo uh, example response plans up on the website, as well as all of the accessory information necessary to support those, such as incident checklist, communication templates, um, advisory signage templates, and, and a whole lot more up there. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And then finally, I just want to mention outreach. Uh, we're, we're constantly working to improve our outreach. Um, we've got a, a long list of, of events and products up on the website, uh, information on upcoming webinars, as well as archived recordings of past webinars and workshops, um, uh, quite a collection of, of HAB related listservs and discussion groups that you can get involved with, as well as just interesting recent papers, uh, upcoming meetings, things like that. And along those lines, I, I want to leave you with a plug for the, the 12th U.S. Symposium on Harmful Algae, which is going to be held this fall in Portland, Maine. Uh, for those unfamiliar, this is a, a meeting that happens every two years, uh, brings together HAB researchers and, and managers, and is an excellent venue to learn about cutting edge research and, and applications. So we hope to see many of you there. Um, and with that, uh, thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Apologize for the, the IT hiccups there at the outset, but I'm gonna hand it over to Ann Grimm to discuss in more detail some of the, the HAB research that we have going on at EPA. So thank you. Thanks, Brandon. All right, and let me know. Hopefully it works for you. <laughs> All righty, let's see. Let's see. Look, yeah, the link appears to be working, so that's good. Or the um, the share. Looks good. All righty. Oh yeah, just adjust the view a little bit here. Let's. All righty. Um, all right. Well, um, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ann Grimm. I'm an assistant center director in the Center for Environmental Measurements and Modeling uh, within Office of Research and Development. And it's my pleasure today to talk about some of um, uh, ORD's research um, with related to HABs. And I, I, uh, it is nice to see Brandon's presentation because you can. Um, there's going to be several places along this presentation where you can see kind of a clear link where ORD research is feeding into um, the overall program. So um, one thing I am going to go off video um, just to make sure my connection stays good, um, but I will come back on at the end. Okay, um, with that, um, I'll start off with the big picture. Um, so um, this work is being done within uh, the water program, which is, uh, we call it the safe and sustainable water resources within ORD. Um, the goal here, um, our, our big objective in the end um, with our research is to provide stakeholders and decision, decision makers at all levels with scientific information and tools, um, both, both to manage HAVs and also to deal with toxicity. Let's see. 
Um, and our program is organized around three main main categories. One is looking at um, health effects and toxicity. Uh, the next is on managing halves in the built and natural environment. And the third one is on the forecasting of halves. Um, and I, what I'm going to do today, because it is a fairly large program, um, is rather than try to give the uh, go go through everything, is I'm just going to um, give you a few examples of some recent work um, in each of these three categories. Um, uh, of course, if you know if you want more specific, this is going to be a very much an overview. So if you do want some um, additional information, please don't hesitate to ask, and I can get your references and and so on. Um, okay, next. OK, um, our first one um, here, we're going to talk about health effects and toxicity, and we have three examples here. So um, the first one is um, related to uh, surveillance of HAVs um, for have associated illnesses. Um, and so the, the issue here is that people and animals um, across the U.S. are exposed to poorly characterized um, aquatic envir environments. Um, and of course, in some cases, that means getting exposed to HABs. And so it's important to have a better understanding of how big of an issue this is. And um, so one tool that's being used to do this is CDC's One Health Harmful Algal Bloom, um, Bloom System. Um, and uh, this is a way of tracking HABs events. The, the goal of the, um, of the system is to characterize health and human and animal illnesses, characterize environmental evidence of HABs exposure, and characterize the acuity and um, healthcare usage. Um, and so now that the system is set up, um, EPA and CTC, the CDC scientists work together um, to evaluate how well the system was working. Um, what they found, um, looking at data from 2016 to 2018, was that 18 steps states had adopted the use of OHABs at that point. Uh, 421 uh, reports were made during that time frame. Um, there were 389 cases of human illnesses and 400, at least 413 animal illnesses associated with HABs events reported. And the uh, link to the first present uh, publication on this work is on the slide. Um, the impact here is really just um, evaluation of the system, but also it uh, just supported the idea that rec, rec water exposure to HABs does pose um, a significant um, risk to the public. Our next project here is um, kind of more on the new tools um, kind of arena. Uh, the The title here is um, Evaluating Effects of uh, Cyanobacteria Using a Human 3D Skin Cell Model. Um, the issue here is that outbreaks um, associated with recreational exposure to cyanobacteria in humans are often uh, reported mainly as skin infections or rashes. Um, and we just don't have a great tool for looking at that. Um, and so, uh, what the the scientists uh, did uh, to do to address this is that they um, investigated the use of a three D uh, human skin cell tissue model. Um, and it was evaluated for its ability to detect this kind of exposure. And um, the model, using this model, they tested it with um, a pure, several purified cyanotoxins, uh, cyanobacterial cells. Um, cell extracts and environmental water samples. And then uh, after that, they looked at the tissue looking for skin tissue viability or uh, yeah, cytokine production and histopathological changes. Um, and using the system, what the team found is that um, cyanobacteria and their metabolites could induce an inflammatory response in this model. Um, and they also identified pathological changes at the site of exposure. And um, as far as what the impact here, I, basically it's a new tool um, and um, they at, at least supports um, continued investigation into this tool uh, for looking at one of the more common um, effects of HABs. Um, and um, we anticipate if you know uh, successful that this will um, ultimately uh, help us interpret natural, natural waterborne exposures um, to HABs. Okay. Um, the third project here is looking at um, health endpoints among non-human animals to support regulatory decision making. Um, and this is work really specifically looking at cyanotoxins, um, and so uh, which are known to cause um, environmental degradation, animal illnesses, and death. And that's of course in addition to affecting humans. And so, but but one thing is that we don't always have a really great handle on 
um, health effects of many of the common cyanotoxins, and, and there's just a continuing need to better understand uh, what the impacts are. And so um, and to address this, what the group uh, did was um, uh, to evaluate the effect of cyanotoxins after oral exposure in mice. Um, and what they, even after exposing the mice, they looked for um, signs of toxic toxicity, um, clinical evidence, so that included uh, evidence of organ toxicity and changes in gene expression. And um, the, um, uh, Sorry, and uh, the results. So first of all, um, they they ended up with two um, interesting results. One was just looking specifically uh, when they set up the the testing. They found that the cyanotoxin standards that they were working with were not universally standardized for mass and purity, and they just really noted that that was a critical piece that needed to be considered when doing toxicity studies. And so they do have a publication on that. Um, and then the second thing was the test itself. Once they worked that out was that um, they looked at several um, common congeners of cyanotoxin. Um, and um, the uh, the one, the slide there, the illustration on the slide um, is was from that paper. Um, the key, I think, find, one of the key findings is microcystin LA was determined to be the most toxic, um, but they also gathered data for the other um, toxic um, uh, congeners as well. And they also noted that the patterns of toxicity, toxic response differed between the congeners. So um, as far as objectives, this supports uh, decision making and also contributes to best practices for future toxic, um, future assessments. Okay, I'll move on to the second area, and this is on managing HABs in the built and natural environment. And um, this first one, I've got I've got two kind of category, two slides on this. One is on um, source water intervention. So this is looking at HABs generally in source water. And um, the uh, problem that the work is uh, that this is aiming towards is um, uh, just the need for more near term measures to understand and mitigate the impact of HABs and toxins in water bodies. And so um, the action here that this is actually a collection of several papers. And so this, again, this is very much an overview. So if you want more specifics, do let me know. But um, this is a collection of um, several projects aimed at using um, bench scale experiments to investigate um, more source water interventions. Um, and I'll kind of combine the actions and the results a little bit to make it a little easier to understand. But um, the one of the things they looked at, for instance, was looking at nutrient absorb absorbent media, so ways to pull nitrogen and phosphorus out of source water. Um, and they they did find some success looking at um, membrane bio using a membrane bioreactor in conjunction with a magnesium carbonate based pellet um, system. Um, another thing they did was to um, track algicide impacts in real time. Um, and in this case, what they used was a fluorescent base, uh, a fluorescent space procedure for tracking uh, cell status. So um, basically looking at cyanobacterial fluorescence can change depending on whether, for instance, it's ex exposed to an algicide. And so tracking it um, using that approach. Um, they um, investigated algicide toxicity to non-target organisms. So in this case, they were doing the test organism they were working at with was Cero, uh, Cero Daphnia dubia, um, and um, and just looking at the impact of algicide on that. Um, the uh, next one, they were looking at um, genetic signals um, to use uh, whether those could be used to um, best time algicide application. And so specifically what they were doing there is that they were taking um, RNA levels of cyanobacterial genes um, uh, and because the RNA level would be expected to increase before um, um, a harmful algal bloom event. And so it it helps indicate when the the sorbent and the um, algicide would best be um, applied. And so they found some success with that. And then this last one is maybe of less interest for this audience, um, but they um, but it, it has to do with source water intervention. But it also involved um, looking at cyanobacteria just from a perspective of being a phototrophic organism and the potential um, for using um, uh, cyanobacteria as a starting point for biofuels. So um, anyway, the impacts here were really aimed at mitigating blooms, um, understanding the impact of bloom mitigation measures, 
um, and in one case looking at um, positive potential positive uses for um, bloom biomass. Okay, the second one on treatment that I'll mention is really um, uh, looking at um, drinking water treatment options for re reducing the exposure to toxins. Um, and the uh, body of work here um, uh, addresses treatment options to ensure that microsystems do not spread in drinking water um, distribution systems. And uh, as Brandon mentioned, you know, this is trying to respond to some of the events that have happened in the past, like um, uh, in Toledo, Ohio in 2014 and Salem, Oregon in 2018. Um, so to address this need, what the researchers did, was evaluated the impact of, um, they, they did several things. They looked at the impact of algicide oxidants on cyanobacterial cells, and in, in particular, the idea of, the uh, you know, if you add an uh, algicide oxidant, does that rupture the cell and therefore release toxins? Um, and looking at those sorts of, um, uh, that looking at that issue, um, they looked at uh, using powdered activated carbon on toxins from the plant um, intake. Um, as a way of removing toxins there. Um, they were looking at cyanobacterial um, metabolites on uh, biologically active filters um, and removing removing them with the biologically active filters. And they also looked at augmenting these filters um, using bioaugmentation. And then um, lastly, they were looking at the um, impact of matrix composition and storage conditions on the results of toxins from treat, uh, treatment sludge. And so um, this work is somewhat still underway. And so I just have a few examples of, um, of results. One is they were, um, they, they did look at changes in cyanobacterial um, uh, cellular fluorescence. Um, they were greater after, and they, um, they demonstrated that there were bigger changes after um, an algicide like hydrogen peroxide treatment was added, but then also it was even larger when you added that in conjunction with UV. So again, they were making use of this fluorescence technique of be being able to monitor um, um, treatment effects. And then um, they also looked at the biologically active filters and um, looked at the impact of seeding them with microcystin degrading bacteria. And they did find that that did help reduce um, toxin levels as well. Um, so the impact here is aimed at uh, better monitoring of Habs related biomass on the characterization of blue material in treated, uh, treatment plant sludges and the removal of um, bloom related toxins. Okay. And then the last topic I'm just going to cover today is the forecasting. And uh, Brandon mentioned um, a lot of this, so I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, so um, this first project is on uh, cyano halves forecasting. Um, and as Brandon mentioned, there is a real need to know when and where an occurrence of cyano halves is likely. Um, to address this, the, uh, the approach they took was a Bayesian spatiotemporal model, um, which was applied to satellite data in order to forecast when the World Health Organization alert level exceedances were likely to occur. Um, they tested this system and they evaluated it and they found that the accuracy of this approach was 90% with a level of sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 91% across the largest 2,192 lakes in the U.S. Uh, the status, this work um, has been completed and published. Um, and actually, there's a presentation uh, related uh, that Blake gave recently on this as well. So if you're interested, I'm, I'm happy to relay that as well. Um, and then um, this work is being was done um, to support um, regulations, including HABHARCA, and also in response to GAO and OIG audits, where the you know, there was no, it wasn't negative. It was just like, if you guys could do more on forecasting, it would really um, uh, be a, a good thing to do in order to, to advance the science uh, in this area. The second one um, that I'm going to talk about, um, Brandon also mentioned, it's the um, risk of um, looking at the risk of toxic uh, cyanohabs across the U.S. lakes. Um, and um, th this is a, a very similar kind of thing in terms of trying to anticipate halves, but it's using a slightly different approach. 
Um, the goal of this study was to identify when lakes in the U.S. are at higher uh, risk for toxic cyanobacterial blooms. And the approach they took is they combined cyan data, which is satellite data, and then with the field st um, samples from the National Lakes Assessment, um, to uh, they used both of those pieces of information to develop a model that indicated where lakes were going to be at high risk. Um, as a result of this work, um, they identified that uh, 70 out of more than 2,000 U.S. lakes were identified as being at high risk for uh, toxic cyanohabs. And the impact here, um, so th this is a basically, um, I, you know, I, I think the approach, the value of it is obvious. If you can identify where the high risk, most high risk lakes are, um, it gives you a better chance to be prepared to respond. Okay. And then um, this is the last project I'll, I'll mention today, um, and uh, it's an up and comer as well. Um, it's kind of um, related to, it's certainly uh, related to the forecasting, but it's a little more near term and it's more um, uh, uh, field level. So um, in this study, what the scientists did was um, the, the approach they took was to look at the nucleic acid concentrations, um, looking specifically at a gene required for cyanotoxin production. Um, and um, what they found, and you can see it on the illustration, is that the, the nucleic acid levels, which are the red and green lines, they start going up before the toxin levels go up. Um, and so this gives um, uh, a little bit of a kind of, they, they describe it as an early warning system. Um, a couple, basically you get a signal a couple week, weeks before the toxins occur. Um, and um, uh, so I, the value of this, I think, is is um, clear, and it's definitely something that's getting a lot of attention. Um, the The impact of this work, of course, is that cyanotoxin encoding genes um, are enabling for these short term predictions of cyano cyanotoxin production, and can help with mitigation. Okay, I'll just close out with the summary, which just reiterates basically we're, we're we have our research um, organized around three areas. I um, um, we'll note that um, what, one thing I do want to just point out that this was just a small collection of projects. There's a lot more there. Um, I will also say that um, it, this is only half the HABs and nutrients program. I, today we focused on the HABs, but we also have a, an equally sized um, nutrients project as well. Um, and it's more on uh, management of nutrients. And um, so there, there's more there if you have questions about that. Um, and then I'll just close out. Um, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask or uh, contact me. You can also contact Anne Ray, who is our lead for Nutrients and Habs. And with that, I'll go ahead and come back on video. Thanks so much, Anne and Brandon. There's a lot of work going on at EPA. Uh, we do have a few minutes for some questions. If folks have questions for Brandon or Anne, just use the raise your hand function. Fred? Yes, uh, great presentations. I, I did have a quick question. Does EPA run its own QPCR um, in-house or do you use uh, academic institutions or commercial labs? Um, we have it in-house. Um, that That's actually um, a big part of uh, what we do. Um, uh, we've used it, we use molecular methods also for things like rec, uh, just um, like rec water as well. So, you, so yeah, no, PCR is, is a big part of what we do in-house. Great. Yeah, I really see that as, as a really effective proactive means of, of trying to stay ahead of not only a bloom, but a bloom that may be producing cyanotoxins. So I know a number of the groups we work with are, are very interested in that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Red. Doug? Hi, um, I have a I have a pretty simple question. I saw that you were talking about using, I guess it was on the bench level, uh, charcoal. Has there any been any experimentation with broadcasting charcoal on bodies of water, like powder charcoal, to sort of precipitate or absorb some of the cyanobacteria? I'm not sure. I know they were looking at um, looking uh, using um, carbon, powdered carbon, looking at intake yeah. um, area. I can 
follow up with somebody who would know that who could respond to that better and uh, res uh, give feedback on your question if you would like. Because I, I work with the local quarry and we had a hab at the end of the season and we're looking to do everything we can to prevent a reoccurrence. So we have okay. monitoring and all that and geese patrol and but um looking for anything that might be of assistance in a non-toxic uh okay. least toxic method. Anyway, so thanks. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. If you could send me your information and I can definitely follow up with the person who could respond to that better. Thank you, Ian. Okay, sure. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Okay, not. I'm going to, at this point, turn it over to our Bureau Chief for the Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring, Chris Coons, who's going to be giving you an overview of New Jersey's 2023 uh, HAB season. So, Chris? Sorry, I'm having trouble stop. Oh, can, stop I'm having trouble stop sharing. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, right. I'll, can I leave or was that? Was that, um, that might work. I'm trying to. Uh, okay, thank you much. Sure thing. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Oh. Hopefully everybody can see that. Yep, looks good. There's so many different ways to share now. <laughs> the presentation, you could do it through PowerPoint, two Absolutely. different ways. Absolutely, they like to make it confusing. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I don't know which one to choose then. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Chelsea mentioned, my name is Chris Coons. I'm the Bureau Chief with the Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring. Um, I'm going to give um, just a you know quick summary of our response for 2023. Three, um, the Bureau is responsible for responding to um, suspected harmful algal blooms that are reported um, through our um, our harmful algal bloom uh, reporting app online, also through um, the DEP hotline, also through email, also through phone calls. Um, so in terms of, you know, the number of water bodies reported for 2023. We had um, 80, 88 individual water bodies reported uh, that we investigated. Um, it was a total of 350 total reports. Um, the asterisk is there because um, that's probably a low number because those are the, the, the numbers we have are only the ones that are reported through the online app. Um, we don't keep track of hotline referrals or emails or phone calls, so the, the number is probably closer to 400. Um, <clears throat> so we did collect, you know, our, sta our staff went out um, to the 88 reported water bodies and we did collect um, samples from 79. Um, the, the visual assessment, um, you know, warranted uh, samples being collected at those water bodies. Um, the other ones that were not um, samples weren't collected at were because um, visual assessment um, uh, deemed uh, that there was no HAB present. So we did end up collecting uh, a total of 470 samples this year. Um, that is, you know, we go to the same water bodies multiple times, depending on um, conditions there. Uh, if there's a beach there, we go multiple times. Um, if that we have continuous monitoring buoys um, deployed, we'll sample multiple times as well. Or, or if we get, um, you know, uh, subsequent reports after the initial. Um, so cell counts and identifications were pr performed on over um, 470 samples, and we did um, over 630 toxin analyses in 2023. 
So this is just a, a quick reminder of our current thresholds. Um, nothing's changing for this year, so these thresholds will be in, in place um, for this season as well. Um, and then, you know, just a, a reminder about the, the signs that we have, um, which we recommend um, people put up um, at their lakes if we, uh, you know, confirm that a harmful algal bloom is present. And then just a reminder about our dashboard. The only thing I wanted to point out here is there's a there's a slight tweak we did this year. And uh, here, you know, you can toggle between um, total um, harmful algal bloom results or um, you can reduce this just to um, those at bathing beaches. So that's that's something new that was uh, implemented this year. But otherwise, uh, everything's the same. And I'll just mention uh, after today's uh, summit, you know, we currently still have 2023 data up there. Um, after today's summit, um, we'll be, um, you know, archiving that 2023 data and getting ready for this year. So in terms of confirmed harmful algal blooms, we had 49 water bodies. Uh, that either had a watch advisory or warning. Two water bodies had the uh, a warning um, alert tier this year, which uh, is one of the or was the highest one that we've seen um, so far. Um, Thirty six water bodies had a uh, have alert tier of advisory and eleven um, were at a watch status. Um, our first confirmed have for 2023 was at Greenwood Lake at the end of April. And then uh, just a comparison from previous years, uh, you could see uh, 2023 is right up there with, um, you know, last year and one of the you know, three most active one years we've had um, to date. Then in terms of, you know, comparing HAB uh, occurrence, the percentage year to year, um, you know, you, you could see again that it's pretty similar the last few years. Um, there is that, you know, dip in 2021 um, that might have been, um, you know, due to, uh, you know, after effects of, um, you know, people uh, you know, working from home, uh, and, you know, after COVID, um, you know, there was less reporting that year uh, in general. And then, as we know, you know, uh, rainfall and temperature are two of the factors that, uh, you know, contribute to the, uh, you know, the presence or, uh, the um, yeah the presence of harmful algal blooms. Um, so we see that you know for um, the past year, you know there's been increased rainfall over much of the state, um, higher than average, and also the temperatures were you know higher than average for much of the year. And just to, you know, these are the most common um, you know, cyanobacteria we found this year um, through all water bodies. Um, our highest uh, cell count this year was at uh, Cozy Lake in Jefferson, which, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about after this presentation. But um, that was the highest this year of 3 million cells per mil. Um, we also had, uh, you know, the highest you know, microcystins concentration at Cozy Lake um, and at 1,511 micrograms per liter. Um, that's of note, that's the highest we've ever seen or ever analyzed um, to date. It's also, um, you know, really close to our next warning or uh, alert tier of danger. Um, so, uh, 
we weren't sure if we were going to get there this year. But, um, and then you can see the other um, toxins, the highest levels at, at various lakes. Again, Cozy Lake with the highest saxitoxin concentration as well for this year. Uh, we still have uh, a number of water bodies with uh, persistent HABs. Um, this, like I said, Cozy Lake. Um, you know, at the end of the the year, we do um, what we call closeout sampling. So any um, harmful algal blooms that are still um, out there, or we haven't visited them in a while, we'll go back out at. Uh, beginning in November and through December to, to take a final sample for the year. So at, at the end of uh, December, these six uh, water bodies still had um, you know, confirmed HABs at that time. So we are beginning um, to collect samples now at all of these lakes um, to see what the current status is. Um, before, um, you know, at least for some of these uh, before beach season begins. And then just a breakdown of, you know, in terms of you know, cell counts um, for the samples that we did collect. So you could see about 16% had cell counts over the 80,000 cells per mil threshold and then you know we had which is the uh, advisory thre threshold and then we had you know 21 percent between 20 and 80,000 which is at the watch threshold and then in terms of um you know, toxin concentrations. Um, again, we had about 13% between two and eight micrograms per liter, and then 3% uh, uh, much higher over eight milligrams per liter. Then just to break down, um, you know, between counties, um, you know, Morris uh, County is uh, represented as high and that, you know, part of that has to do with, you know, the, having Lake Apakong there where we take a lot of samples and get a lot of reports. Um, and also, you know, with Cozy Lake, we were there quite often as well. So that's probably why it's a little bit higher than the rest. In terms of, you know, the upcoming season, um, you know, we have an annual HAB report every year. Um, we're reviewing and updating that um, now. Um, hope to have that by the 1st of May, um, if not sooner. Um, the same with uh, the HAB strategy. Um, you know, every year we review the strategy to um, determine if uh, updates are needed. Um, at this time, we have no, after reviewing it, you know, initially, we don't have any uh, major changes that are coming. Um, there may be some editorial changes that need to be done, um, uh, web links that need to be updated and stuff like that. But for the same thing applies, um, you know, we hope to have that by the, the 1st of May um done if not sooner um but um when we do that that'll be announced um just wanted to remember uh remind people about the handheld phycocyanin meter meters that we loan out we've loaned a, a bunch of them out over the years um people have them um i'm just you know asking that if uh, people on the call have have them and they haven't been 
checked or calibrated um, recently, please get in touch with me so I can have staff, um, you know, coordinate picking those up or um, coming on site to check them out and, and recalibrate them. Um, the calibration should be done, um, you know, yearly. So I think in some cases that we haven't seen the meters in a, in a while, so we really need to get out and um, collect those and bring them back to you if they, after they've been calibrated. And then we're also working on um, on the reporting app. We have some, a number of volunteers reporting um, harmful algal blooms for us. I think in 2023, there was over 200 volunteer reports. Um, again, a lot of them were from Lake Apacom, where um, people do have phycocyanin meters, so they were reporting that information. We're trying to um, kind of evaluate that and tweak how that's reported this year. Um, we're still working on that, but um, the the issue that we're having is that the the readings that are coming from the phycocyanometers are being entered into a, a text or a comments uh, field and it makes it much more difficult for us to extract that information um, that could be useful in, in helping us uh, determine if we need to get out to a lake and uh, take samples. Of. So I'll ask uh, people to cooperate on that, and I think that's that's it for this one. Thanks, Chris. And he gave you a little bit of a teaser on Cozy Lake, so we're just going to have Chris jump right into his next presentation, which is a case study on harmful uh, algal bloom impacts on Cozy Lake. And after his presentation, we're going to take a, a short break. So, all right. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Uh, Looks good. Okay. Good. Um, all right. So, yeah. Um, you know, as Katie said in the beginning, it seems like or hinted at um, every year we end up with some new wrinkle or some new um, aspect of harmful algal blooms that comes up that we weren't necessarily prepared for, and that takes you know, you know, a lot of effort by a lot of different people to try and understand um, the issue and respond to it. So it, that was no different this year with uh, Cozy Lake. So. so uh, Cozy Lake, just as a background, it's located in Jefferson Township. This is, you know, a typical lake community um, created in the early 1900s. Um, you know, initially created as, uh, you know, a vacation community um, for people in the city to get away for the weekend. Um, there's approximately 27 acres of surface area there. The drainage area upstream is about 1.8 square miles. And surrounding the lake, there's, you know, close to 300 um, homes. And just a, a quick map in relation, you know, Green Pond is, you know, near Picatinny uh, Arsenal and, you know, Lake Apacong is to the southwest from here. So we got an initial report of a uh, suspect to have this year on uh, July 3rd. Um, you know, on July 5th, um, we sent staff uh, up to the lake um, to collect samples uh, at the beach. There is a bathing beach there. Um, our cell counts and toxins, 
toxin analyses were completed on July 7th, um, and you could see that they were quite high in both cases, you know, above 2 million um, cells and uh, above 1200 uh, micrograms per liter. So that initially that immediately um, prompted a have alert tier of warning, uh, which resulted in a beach closure. On July 19th, um, the Bureau was you know, given information that the some of the homes um, near the lake um, and on lakefront had um, very shallow wells or and in some cases point wells. And there was also the existence of, you know, potentially septic systems that were improperly maintained and cesspools still in use. Um, so a, a cross program team from DEP was quickly assembled um, on July 19th. It was probably with, within hours of getting this information because obviously um, we you know, understood the risk or the, the potential risk um, if in fact, you know, wells were um, in use that were very shallow or, you know, those point type wells. Um, we were concerned that, um, you know, interactions between surface water and groundwater um, near the lake could potentially have uh, effects on people's drinking water. So, you know, as I said, within hours we were in discussions um, about how to respond to this um, to be as protective as possible. So the the course of action was to um, you know have a drinking water advisory posted as soon as possible. So on July twentieth, uh, an initial public notice regarding the drinking water advisory was uh, posted to Jefferson Township's website as well as. Um, you know, the Cozy Lake Association's uh, Facebook page. Um, and as part of that advisory, uh, bottled water was made available um, to residents who requested it. Uh, the, the map is just um, an idea of uh, or, or a representation of what we were looking at. So based on, you know, the evaluation by DEP staff, you know, we came up with, um, you know, an area that was most at risk. So we determined that, you know, about 200 feet from the shoreline, um, those homes would be, uh, you know, at the most at most risk for having surface and groundwater interactions. Um, as part of that evaluation, you know, we reviewed, you know, existing um, well permits or well permit records, and you know, in the whole community, we only found about thirty percent of the homes have wells with permit records um, with it for DEP. We also came up with a a, a very quick. Um, plan you know obviously we couldn't we didn't have the capacity to sample every single home so uh, we came up with a number of about 20 as a target um, as part of the the initial drinking water notice residents were um, urged to um, get in touch with uh, the bureau um, we developed a questionnaire that we were asking um, residents who call about their homes, about their wells, um, you know, where their homes were located to determine, you know, which homes would, you know, best represent what we were trying to find out. So we started getting, you know, phone calls almost immediately. We got many phone calls over that. I think this was, I think, July 20th was either a Thursday or a Friday. We started getting phone calls almost immediately, um, you know, through the weekend. Um, and 
So, so like I said, we did come up with very quickly again uh, a sampling plan to sample to, uh, about 20 homes. So between um, July 24th and July 28th, we did sample 21 homes. Um, we were the sampling plan called for collecting samples um, pre-treatment and post-treatment. So pre-treatment ended up being in most cases, you know, right from the storage tank before it goes into any kind of filters or UV light or uh, water softeners. So that was the ideal location. Um, in some cases, if uh, homeowners weren't going to be home, we uh, took samples from the outdoor uh, spigot. And then, you know, post treatment, um, those uh, samples were collected from kitchen sinks where, where possible. So the analysis um, of the microsystem samples, um, I'll just, we um, analyzed all the samples using US EPA method uh, 546. Um, and, you know, we did confirm that toxins were present at at detectable concentrations at homes um, near the lake. You know, out of the 21 homes, um, 12 had um, detectable concentrations of microcystins, and those were both uh, pre and post treatment. So this is just a, a, a summary of that, and you could see like the number of homes sampled total, which ones had detectable concentrations, um, you know, the number of samples collected, pre-treatment, post-treatment, it was pretty even. Um, and it, there was no, you know, at least, you know, it is a small data set with only 21 homes, but there doesn't appear to be any um, pattern emerging from that it didn't seem to matter if it was uh, if people had treatment on their system or not so on um august 3rd uh, based on the um, the toxin analysis that we did uh, there was an updated drinking water notice um, posted on Jefferson Township's website again. Um, the as part of the new drinking water notice, um, we recommended that all residents near the lake near the lake get their uh, wells tested by certified laboratories and um, inspected by licensed well drillers. Um, so and individual homeowners where we did collect samples, they were given their results, um, their exact uh, results and uh, specific rec recommendations for for their homes. Um, which were in line with uh, the recommendations that we gave for all residents. So. Um, In terms of, you know, the results that we found on the lake um, with. You know, in terms of homeowners, um, the highest level we found was 0 0.1 micrograms per liter. It doesn't reach the threshold of EPA's health advisory of 0 0.3, but. They were at detectable levels, so there is a, you know. We do feel strongly that there's a, a connection there somewhere between surface water and groundwater. Um, so we you know, we confirm that and you know we feel the recommendations were um, you know appropriate for the homeowners in that area. Um, we did collect uh, additional samples as well in August. So you could see that's when we had the highest uh, cell count and microsystems concentration. Um, and then we uh, sampled again, you know, a few times, but our last sample that we collected was on November 8th, um, and that had this, the highest saxitoxin concentration. So at this time, um, Cozy Lake just um, 
based on the last sample that we collected, it still remains at a have alert tier of advisory. Um, we will be going out again soon um, to collect more samples to see what the status of the, the harmful algal bloom is now. Um, just some of the challenges associated with um, Cozy Lake. You know, they do have a lake association, um, but membership is voluntary. So only a, a, a limited number of homeowners contributed or contribute to the association. So because of that, you know, they have a limited uh, amount of funds for maintenance and treatment of HABs. Um, so that's uh, and then, you know, like I said, many of the homes, you know, were the community was created in the early 1900s. So many of the homes, um, you know, been around a long time and a lot of. Um, a lot of these homes, like I said, were vacation homes, so they might be passed down from generation to generation. Um, so there's no, you know, well or septic inspections associated with, um, you know, buying a new home. So um, I think a lot of that is a, a unfortunate that that happens, but that, that's where we're at with it. And then in terms of just to, you know, go back to, you know, well permits in general, you know, before 1947, um, no permits were required and no um, specific depths were requ required of wells. So if the wells have been there a long time, they, they probably don't have, um, you know, they probably are very shallow. They may or may not have casings. Uh, some of them, you know, we were told were hand dug. Um, so you know, it wasn't until 1996 that, you know, a certain length of casing was required. Uh, so, like I said, these these homes, a lot of these homes are quite old. Um, and we'll continue to have um, issues like this. You know, and just for the coming year, um, we did decide that we're putting a continuous continuous monitoring buoy at Cozy Lake this year. Um, it's actually going to be deployed tomorrow, um, and you know, we'll because we'll be there, we'll collect uh, the the first um, harmful algal blooms uh, sample for the season to see, um, you know, with how that if that harmful algal bloom is still present. Um, there's ongoing discussion regarding treatment options. Um, you know, there's because of the the Lake Association's uh, limited funding, um, you know, some of the chemical options are much more expensive, uh, but biological um, Using biological agents um, hasn't been um, fully approved by DEP yet. Um, I think there's discussions about approving them, and some of them may be approved soon, which may be may provide for a, a cheaper or, or more affordable option. Um, and there is, you know, ongoing discussions about um, developing uh, an intensive study to investigate um, surface and groundwater. In, Real, um, interactions. And then I just wanted to point out that there is a lake community fact sheet um, out there. Um, yeah, I apologize for the link, but that that is what the, the link is um, for the fact sheet. Um, but it is on the divisions, Division of Water Monitoring Standard and Pesticide Controls um, Harmful Algal Bloom website under fact sheets. So you can find it there. But the, but the link does work. Uh, uh, but the I guess the the one thing that we all have to keep in mind is that, uh, that there's a lot of these uh, small lake communities just like this out there. Uh, there's a lot of these lake communities that were 
developed around the same time and for the same reason. So the the infrastructure, you know, well and septic isn't probably up to uh, code for most homes in those communities. So they are at risk and, you know, we'll have to continue to monitor that and come up with uh, ways to, you know, educate people and uh, you know, try to address these situations. Oh, I think that's it for me. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, so we do have a couple minutes for some questions. I know there's an ongoing conversation in the chat regarding the FICO and meter loan program, and we can continue to have that conversation in the chat. And um, does anybody have any questions for Chris regarding Cozy Lake or 2023? Just raise your hands. Okay. Uh I'll just say for the FICO, cyanam, the FICO cyanometer, just get in touch with me in my bureau and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll work things out. Okay, we got a lot of questions for you. I hope we can get to them all. All right, Donna? <laughs> okay. Oh, you're muted still. You're muted. Hi, it's Donna from the Lake of Pacon Foundation. Um, could you just talk a little bit, Chris, about um, for the volunteer monitoring effort, um, how the DEP utilizes that data? And um, if when you, you know, you talk about how you might update the um, data entry form, um, will you be doing updates to your SOP for the volunteer monitoring? Um, I don't think we... Let me answer the first part of your question first. Okay. Um, so we use the the volunteer monitoring data as a screening tool, um, not just from Lake of Bacong, but from all volunteers that send it to us. But um, basically, we're looking for the FICO cyanide readings if they are above, um, you know, our current, you know, threshold that we use to determine if we should. Um, go look at a lake and collect a sample is 13. Um, so if we see readings above 13, you know, we do want to collect samples. Um, the, the challenge has been, and that's why I, I was talking about um, updating the, the reporting form, is that a lot of the, the numbers are mixed in with a lot of text um, so in order to efficiently use them, um, we have to kind of extract that information. Um, it'll be a lot easier if we can get um, that data put into its own field. Um, so then we could track these things a, a lot easier and quicker. Um, so, um, and then as far as the SOP, we're not going to, I don't think we need to update the SOP, but we probably do need to send out a reminder of what the, the SOP is um, to make sure people are still, you know, following that. So I think that's, hopefully Thanks. I answered all your questions. All right, Doug is up next, and we might have time for one quick one after Doug. Go ahead. Uh, this, this is a really quick question. Uh, you talked about the drinking water having issues pre and post treatment um were any did you were, were any post treatment uh scenarios successful like activated carbon or ro filter or something like that did you find any any of the treatment that made the water drinkable just to um, clarify that these were like homeowner wells, not yeah. not drinking water systems with treatment. I, 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 so. have, I have a chart <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Chris. my homeowner will, well mm -hmm. because I had some other stuff in it. And I'm living in an area where people have arsenic sometimes in the water, so they have RO systems. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering, were there, would there be anything a homeowner in that situation could do to protect themselves? Well, I it think was... Uh, As it yeah, do you want to just kind of like go over really quickly, Chris, the different types, the the very large range of treatment? I'm using it in quotes because yeah, I mean, some of them like, and then Rob Newby can take like a, a minute or two to kind of kind of elaborate further. 
to go ahead. No, I mean, it, it varied quite a bit home to home. Um, some people just had a whole house filter. Some people had the whole nine yards. Um, it didn't seem to make a difference, um, at least what was in place there. We didn't, because this um, sampling effort happened so quickly, you know, we didn't collect a whole lot of, you know, exact information on what treatment was in place. And we didn't have, you know, our staff isn't trained to identify, you know, a lot of those treatment systems themselves and the homeowners didn't have that information either. So um, that was part of the reason we were thinking of, you know, a more intensive study where we could have a, a more thorough and controlled um, effort. Okay. Well, thank you. And I have to say you guys did a wonderful job. I love your response. That was government in action as it should be. So thanks. Okay. And I think with that, we're pretty close on time. So in order to give us a few minutes break in between um, the sessions, I'm going to take five minutes. So everybody be back here exactly at 10 30 and then we'll we'll tee off with the expert team and the have lake management guidance so we'll see you in a few minutes welcome back everybody um all right, and we're just going to get right started into, I'm going to hand it off to our expert team, starting off with Jason Adolph. Wait, are you going first? Yeah, going first. and I'm going to yep. present the slides for, for all of us as well. Okay, perfect. So I will right. go for a screen share here, and you let me know if you're it's loading. seeing a yep, title I slide can... in presentation mode. Looks great. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Chelsea, and um, I'm very happy to be here to present an overview uh, of the lake uh, guidance document, along with uh, co-lead of the HAB expert team, Bob Cortman. Um, so first, I want to just start by introducing the team. Um, uh, shown here, uh, a number of uh, Great individuals to work with from academia, uh, private industry, um, and extend a thanks to Mike Danko of the New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium, who has kept us on task and on track throughout the whole thing. And the DEP um, uh, uh, HAB team that's that that we've been working with throughout the the years on these uh, tasks that we've been working with, uh, working on. OK, so the first thing I want to do is, is give you a an, an overview of kind of the mindset that we went into this document with um, broad overarching themes. The goal, of course, was to provide technical information and help to non experts that will enable and help them to identify things that lead to HABs, um, uh, weigh and measure and evaluate methods to prevent and reduce HABs as well as managing uh, people and a system when you know you're going to have HABs. Um, a, a big overarching theme that came out of the data analysis we did with the DEP data and, and our personal experiences was that uh, people need to realize that all water bodies are unique and one HAB is not like another HAB. Um, they don't they don't all work the same way. It's really important. You can't just transplant one HAB management plan from one system to another. You really have to understand the system uh, in which you're working in order to make an effective plan. Um, so here I have pictures of different lakes from an article that I hope you all saw, the nine most beautiful lakes in New Jersey. I, I have a link down there um, just to illustrate that point. There's some things about lakes that you can see are different, and there's lots about lakes that you can't see that are different, such as the chemical and the microbiological composition. Another broad overarching theme was to focus in these plans on long-term improvements um, that are going to have a lasting effect, uh, not things that are just band-aid band fixes or short-term fixes on, on the spot. Uh, nutrient control was a priority. 
that we emphasized in, in building HAB management plans, and also understanding the composition of cyanobacteria to the non-professional, it might not be obvious that cyanobacteria is a broad term that encompasses lots and lots of different taxa, and those taxes are very different from each other and have different dynamics and potential effects on human and public health. Um, there are often many groups working together uh, from different angles, and we emphasize that it's critical to have people working together, especially when have treatments are involved that involve large scale environmental manipulations. And then finally, um, uh, to, to be cognizant of the fact that everything we're doing with HABs, monitoring, management, rest, restoration, and uh, mitigation plans, we're doing in the context of a, a changing climate, which is very likely to exacerbate harmful algal bloom problems in these systems. That's kind of the overview. This is the overview of the document. Um, uh, just to give you an idea of what's in the document by, by chapters. And I'm going to give you a, a little more detailed summary about two of the chapters. The first one is, is about HAB management and guidance for making a HAB manage, management plan. So within that chapter, we emphasize the need to um, uh, understand the, the physical uh, geological characteristics characteristics of the lake in which they're working, and there are links provided to resources, geological resources from the state that uh, go into more detail than what's shown here, but that, that can be used to gather data to, to fill out that background portion of a, of a good plan, uh, and also links for chemical and biological characteristics. We emphasize the importance of including public participation uh, in, a, in a management plan, not only in uh, citizen scientists and community scientists sampling of lakes, as is shown with these two young ladies sampling in Asbury Park here, or these images here, but also in planning and identifying the, the problems from the stakeholder's perspective of, of what is going on and, and, and what's, what's being uh, hindered in terms of lake use by the harmful algal blooms that are occurring. Um, and then, uh, in gathering the data, it's important to identify um, what, what data, data there are, what data you need, and therefore what data gaps exist, and we're going to really focus resources on filling in those data gaps. And this is done basically by uh, gathering people and having conversations, uh, relying on local knowledge and professional knowledge um, together to, to identify what really needs to be done. Um, continuing in, in this chapter, we emphasize uh, again the need for the background data on phytoplankton dynamics in general, as well as have summaries. Um, there, you know, some phytoplankton are good, and we need phytoplankton in lakes, but they're not all good, and that's basically when the, the haps happen. Um, identifying specific pollution sources that are important, as well as setting good goals. Uh, every plan to do anything has to be capped off by a good set of manageable, reachable goals um, with, with a way to know whether or not you've, you've gotten there. Uh, in this context, uh, we emphasize that although these signs may go up at the lake, the issue with the lake is probably contained within the watershed. So we want uh, to be sure that, that plans are, are have management plans focus on the watershed approach, treating the source of a problem, not just the symptom of the problem, which is what we see in the lakes. Um, the next chapter I'm going to overview is about water quality monitoring um, uh, itself. So uh, we start off by distinguishing, you know, what is it, what is it meant by water quality? Uh, and what is meant by HAB monitoring? There are two different things. I would say one is a subset of the other. They're related, but not all water quality monitoring is useful for HAB monitoring. Um, so we recommend uh, a, a list of parameters to be included, in, uh, including simple things like water temperature, clarity, uh, precipitation, and lake levels, to more complicated things like dissolved oxygen, uh, nutrient analyses, things that would probably require professional input. Um, and total chlorophyll A, 
cyanobacteria, cell counts, and cyanotoxin measurements, as well as uh, uh, phycocyanin and uh, fluorescence measurements, as, as several have talked about before, um, earlier today. Um, and we also give links to uh, DEP resources for further data, such as uh, overflights, buoys, and uh, the we mentioned the phycocyanin fluorometer loan program, which uh, I don't think we saw a picture, but this is one of the phycocyanin probes, and you simply stick it in the water and read a number. It's pretty simple to use, um, and as Chris pointed out, as if it's calibrated properly, very useful. Um, we spent a, a good bit of time on the cyanobacterial community composition data, and I would summarize uh, our, our thinking as saying that the, the kind of cell count sampling that's done for, for um, uh, monitoring and um, uh, monitoring HABs is different from the kind that's done to, to really give you an, an ecological understanding of community composition. Um, so. The things that we have emphasized here were the need for in some systems for depth resolution of sampling as well as different times of day because of the the the, the diurnal cycles of cyanobacteria they could be hiding five meters beneath the surface and you would miss them if you just sample the surface the need the great need for proactive year-round sampling in other words sampling before the hab occurs which is necessary for understanding why the hab occurs uh, the we, we found that the dominant taxa approach to counting cyanobacteria um, really didn't lend itself to a uh, good community analysis. But cell counting for community analysis is understandably very, very difficult to do. So we suggested um, along those lines, another thing has been talked about today of employing these genomics approaches, including, including qPCR. Um, and I have an example shown here from coastal lakes. The gra graph on the right is total cell count against the the, nu the number of cyanobacterial 16S genes detected by qPCR. You see the relationships about as good as what you'd get from a phycocyanin fluorometer versus total cell counts over here. Um, and down here is a map from uh, meta barcoding, which is another technique that we suggested to get a community composition. This is when you you use what's called next gen sequencing to get all of the taxonomic genes for all bacteria in a system and then um, analyze in such a way that you can determine the community composition. There's a lot of math behind the colors on these plots, but basically what it comes down to is each different color point on this here is a different community composition determined but through 16S metabarcoding. So it's a very simple way um, if the, if the uh, pipeline's in place to get a quick look at what kinds of cyanobacteria are growing in different areas. Um, I, I would I'd venture to say it, it's more scalable and simpler in the end than counting cells at a microscope, but I don't like counting cells at a microscope. I'll admit that up, up front. Uh, and then finally, to conclude the overview of this chapter, um, in advising um, uh, people undertaking water quality monitoring and have monitoring, um, we advise that they understand the dynamics of uh, HABs in that system. And this graphic over here is showing Deal Lake and Sunset Lake, and the fact that really the blooms occur in both of these systems at a very constrained time of year each year. This is a five-year period here, and each peak is a, a, a year. Um, so that information is important for, for letting you know when and where you should take sampling and focus on there being a bloom. Um, and while you should do year-round sampling, your effort can be um, focused more during the HAB season. Uh, I already talked about the recommendation to sh shift to more proactive sampling and vertical um, profile sampling. So I'll end with um, climate change. Climate change is a huge issue that is likely to to affect HABs and systems. This cartoon or uh, diagram that I found on the web sums it up really well. With both warmer lakes and stronger storms leading to more runoff and more stratification and higher nutrients, that's kind of the recipe for causing algal blooms of the sort that we're interested in here, cyanobacteria. Um, so 
it's very important and is emphasized in this document to keep that in in mind as you're going through the planning um, and development of plans, uh, uh, monitoring plans. So uh, I'm going to send the controls or Bob, should I just control for you? Uh, OK. There you go. Control granted, Bob. It's all yours. Good morning. I'm going to present the chapter from the guidance document on the selection of action items to control harmful algae blooms. It's important to understand the system that you're working on, uh, and that's done through monitoring both of monitoring to track a developing bloom, as well as diagnostic mo monitoring to determine what the forcing factors are that cause the bloom. It's also important to understand both the lake and the watershed. Back in the 1970s and early 80s, everyone was focused on studying the structure and function of the water body, which led to identifying the importance of watershed loading, especially non-point source loading. And then came along the 1987 uh, amendments to the Clean Water Act, and all of the focus tended to shift to the watershed. Uh, we need to start seeing lakes as one integrated whole system of land and water. You want to select measures that overall reduce nutrients um, while maintaining a nitrogen phosphorus ratio and other aspects that don't give cyanobacteria a competitive advantage. You need to keep your sights on the long-term goals of lake management and develop long-term strategies. And sure, you will likely need short-term strategies to mitigate any nuisance conditions or health uh, risk, uh, but it's really the long-term that you're managing the lake for. Climate change impacts have been observed and are likely to intensify, and they can com complicate the effectiveness of management strategies. And the best controls are controlling the source of loading uh, rather than trying to mitigate once loading has occurred. Selection of action items involves several aspects. The first thing that you should be doing is to determine what is already known about the lake watershed ecosystem. Uh, has there been a TMDL developed for it? And have nutrient sources already been identified so that you can focus on uh, controlling those sources? When evaluating potential alternative management strategies, there are a number of considerations. You need to estimate the effectiveness, both long and short term. Uh, how long is it going to take to implement? What are the possible intended or unintended consequences? You certainly don't want to do harm in trying to manage a lake. You need to estimate the cost, and that involves both the implementation costs and the ongoing operation and maintenance costs involved. You need to identify the regulatory and permitting requirements and the time that it may take for benefits to be noticed. Uh, cyanobacteria blooms in particular can take several annual cycles to respond to management. And you need to determine whether the strategy is acceptable to the landowner, the community, the lake users, and the regulators. For example, is it appropriate to have 
surface structures on the lake um, or not. And a HAB strategy or technique needs to be specific to a particular ecosystem. Uh, sometimes you'll identify aspects of a system that can be used for management. A number of impacts related to climatic variability and change have been observed in recent years, particularly over the last decade or so. Everyone recognizes that in general, uh, climate is warming, uh, but that warming is happening more quickly during the autumn and winter. Uh, also, precipitation is occurring more and increasing more in the autumn and winter, and that precipitation is typically now coming in liquid form rather than a snowpack accumulation, which will uh, melt gradually in the spring. Some of the impacts of climate change on lake ecosystems that have been identified involve early growing seasons, early thermal stratification, uh, increased internal loading of both uh, anaerobic respiration products as well as phosphorus, and perhaps most importantly, altering the seasonal succession of different algae groups. For example, at Brick Reservoir uh, in coastal New Jersey, uh, during a cold winter, early spring, diatoms flourished, whereas during a very mild winter and spring, diatoms crashed very early and subsequently cyanobacteria uh, reach much higher cell densities. Uh, indeed, the densities of cyanobacteria became very high after fall turnover to the point where they can start um, persisting through the winter to the next spring. And you'll hear more about cyanobacteria overwintering uh, later this afternoon. It's going to become more important to pay attention to lakes between October and the following April. The guidance document prepared by the HAB expert team that was assembled uh, includes watershed methods as well as in-lake methods. And there are two main strategies when addressing non-point source pollution. Uh, the first and the first goal is to prevent uh, the mobilization of nutrients in the first place, as close to where precipitation falls as possible. The other aspect is to reduce the pollutant load as it flows toward the water body. Uh, there are many sources that have been identified, animals, geese, fertilizers, septic systems, stormwater. Uh, on the tables and figures to the left side of this slide, uh, it, it shows the relative amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus coming from different land covers and also indicates that most of our rainfall events are on the smaller side, less than a half of an inch or so. And the first wash of surfaces, the first flush, is what will carry the highest concentrations of contaminants, especially total phosphorus, but also other contaminants. So if you can deal with the first flush of a half inch of a precipitation event, you'll be dealing with most of the storms that we encounter, as well as the first half inch flush of larger storm events. There are many low impact development techniques available for specific situations. When lakes become thermally stratified during the summer with the warm water, which is less dense, floating on the colder water uh, which is more dense, uh, 
the bottom waters are isolated from atmospheric content, so they don't get replenished with oxygen. That can lead to internal loading of anaerobic respiration products and phosphorus, both of which stimulate cyanobacteria. It's important to note that it's, it's not oxygen loss that results in internal loading, but it's the subsequent anaerobic respiration. So if you determine that internal loading is a significant factor relative to uh, initiation of blooms, then there are three critical features of the water column to examine. The mixing depth, the depth of 1% light penetration, which can support photosynthesis, and the highest ascent of the oxygen loss boundary. From a management perspective, you want to ma maintain separation between the mixing depth and the anoxic boundary, as well as reduce the area and duration of, of oxygen loss on the bottom of the lake. And that's one of the aspects that is becoming problematic with climate change increasing the duration of summer stratification. The other approach to controlling internal loading is to do a sediment amendment using either an aluminum, iron, or lanthanum-based material to bind up phosphorus in the sediment regardless of oxygen loss. The guidance document describes and discusses a number of control measures for in-lake control of nutrient loading. The Biomanipulation, as referred to in the guidance do, uh, document, is really referring to bioaugmentation treatments, which the HAB team uh, is not recommending at this time. There are other biomanipulation methods which can be very useful, including trophic level management. Trophic level management is basically ensuring that there's an adequate fish eating population to control the number of fish that prey on the zooplankton that graze on algae to maintain a balanced food web and a grazing rate for phytoplankton. There are also methods in the lake that tend to focus on controlling the inputs of nutrients from the watershed, including floating wetland islands and inlet forebays. Um, and the document describes a number of limitations and precautions uh, on those techniques. Then there's the nutrient inactivation approach that I mentioned previously. Uh, using either aluminum, iron, or lanthanum-based substances. Uh, recognize that nutrient activation can bind phosphorus in the sediment despite anoxia, but it doesn't deal with oxygen loss. So if one of your long-term management goals is to maintain uh, habitat in the bottom uh, layers of the lake, uh, oxygen temperature for cool water fish, nutrient activation is not going to directly manage that. Then there are a number of circulation, aeration, and oxygenation methods uh, that can control internal loading. Uh, if your lake is uh, a moderately deep lake, perhaps uh, between five and seven meters deep. Uh, it may be appropriate to just maintain a well-mixed condition, uh, preventing thermal stratific stratification and the stagnation of the bottom layer and oxygen loss and internal loading. Uh, that can be accomplished by what people think of as quote-unquote aeration, where you have bubblers creating an airlift water plume that pumps water from 
near bottom to the surface and circulates it bottom to top. That can also be accomplished in a downward direction mechanically um, from any depths so that you can actually maintain a warmer cap on a cooler bottom layer uh, while maintaining an aerobic deep layer. Those techniques can be driven by the grid, they can be solar, or they can be wind powered. If your lake is deeper, uh, you probably want to consider uh, a method that preserves stratification. Uh, if the oxygen loss boundary ascends no higher than the thermocline, then hypolinetic aeration may be a good choice, or oxygenation. If the anoxic boundary ascends well into the middle layer or even to the bottom of the mixed uh, layer, perhaps layer aeration would be a better choice. Any of the bubble pumping methods, the diffused air, artificial circulation, hypolimnetic aeration, layer aeration, uh, could be done with air, which contains 21% oxygen, or you can enhance that oxygen content by tapping in an oxygen generator and increasing the compressed air to 40, 50, 60 percent uh, oxygen content. Most recently, oxygenation methods have been developed, um, <clears throat> conical de contacted devices, uh, line diffusers that are designed specifically not to destratify the lake, um, methods that pump water from the lake, uh, supersaturate it on land with oxygen, and return it at depth of the lake. There are also a number of emerging technologies. Uh, sound, sonic algae control devices have become popular for certain types of uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, it's especially the very buoyant nitrogen fixing genera like aphanazomenon and dolichospermum. Then there's peroxyhydrate algicide. Uh, we do talk about algicide treatments. Uh, peroxyhydrate is basically the active ingredient is peroxide and it treats the algae by oxidation rather than the toxicity mode that is uh, accomplished with copper-based products. Copper-based products are very toxic to the animals that eat algae, whereas peroxyhydrate tends not to be. So it can be more selective. It also is much more difficult and costly treatment, um, but used early in the season, uh, research is starting to indicate that it can be an effective treatment for uh, cyanobacteria bloom initiation. Then there are methods that are specific to a lake and or reservoir. Uh, you can make the inflow plunge to depth below the illuminated uh, surface water, or you can make water uh, leave over the spillway from depth to enhance circulation uh, and flushing rate of the deep layer to overcome oxygen deficit rate. And there are a number of solar and wind powered apparatus that have been uh, developed recently. And with that, I'll turn it back uh, for concluding remarks. And if you have any questions for the expert team, go ahead and, and load those into the chat. Um, we're going to keep things moving uh, with Catherine Schaefer. She's a Bureau Chief in Watershed and Land Management, and she'll be going over some implementation of the uh, HAP specific RFP grant funding. So we can already see your slides. Great. Go ahead, Catherine. Good. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so 
I'm going to be presenting about some status updates of um, our grants. Um, sorry, my notes are not coming up. Give me one second. See, everybody's having a having problems today, right? It's been a, a, a bundle of Teams fun today. So. Yeah, and I practiced and it was coming up fine. <laughs> Would you like me to share your slide? No, I got, Would that I got be better? It's, a, got it? it's, okay. all, it's all good. Um, I'm, it's a quick presentation anyway. So in, in 2019, we um, released an RFP that was specifically for HAB fundings. Um, we awarded nine grants for HABs. Um, in the, it was the 2019 RFP number one. Um, I'm going to give a brief um, overview of the status of all of those nine grants. Um, a total of what was awarded was $2.5 million for those nine grants. Um, yes. So the first grant was the evaluation of innovative measures to prevent and mitigate and or control HABs in Lake Hopatcon. Um, this grant was awarded to the Lake Hopatcon Commission for $500,000. Um, it is still ongoing. Um, we are looking, we are expecting this to be closed out and completed by the end of the year. Um, this grant installed rain gardens and installed a freshwater wetland islands It installed biochar and the treatment has been completed um, what is still left to do is the monitoring and the final reporting of the grant we did we awarded an, a grant for the implementation and evaluation of several innovative in-lake management techniques to prevent, mitigate, and control HABs in Lake Mohonk in Sussex County. It was awarded to the Lake Mohonk Preservation Foundation. They were awarded $160,000, $920,000. Um, the project is still ongoing. It is near the end. They're expected to complete and close out by the end of the year. Um, there was two in-lake management measures designed to prevent, mitigate, and control the development of HABs in Lake Mohonk, which were the focus of the study. The first management me measure assessed the alternative non-copper-based algicide green clean, which is a strong oxidizer that controls cyanobacteria and breaks down cyanotoxins. The second management measure involved the use of FOSLOC, a nutrient inactivator to reduce phosphorus availability in the water column and the sediments in specific section of Lake Mohonk, which was Turtle Cove. Both green, green clean and FOSLOC treatments are considered as I as viable in lake management techniques to prevent, mitigate, and or control HABs, particularly in near shore beach areas where people and pets can have direct contact with cyanotoxins. However, an important factor that they came to the conclusion in the grant was that in dictating the poten potential effectiveness and duration of effectiveness is how isolated or separated the treatment area is um, related to the main body of the lake. Um, our next grants that we awarded was for the HAP Prevention in Rosedale Lake. Um, this was the grantee was Mercer County Park Commission. It was for $185,000. This grant has been completed, but instead, um, Bob Schuster is going to present after me and he's going to elaborate on this. So I'm just going to skip right over it. Um, we awarded a grant to the um, I'm off slide off um we so we awarded a grant to the greenwood lake commission for nutrient reduction measures in belcher creek to reduce habs in greenwood lake we awarded fifty two thousand eight hundred dollars this project is also ongoing it is close to being closed out uh, most of most of the information has been completed we're just waiting to do the final report um the grantee has collected flow data, water quality data, pollutant and hydro hydrologic load data. The yellow dots on the map show the areas that the data collection has taken place. Additionally, a floating wetland island has been installed. The grantee is still working on collecting data to use 
the measure success post installation and confirm that the planting of the floating island floating wetland island species have all thrived successfully. We expect the final reports by the end of this year. We awarded a grant to the City of Newark Department of Water and Sewer Utilities for $475,000. Um, this project is also still ongoing and we do expect it to be closed out by the end of this year. It was for ultrasonic algae control treatment in the water supply reservoir serving the Pequannock Water Treatment Plant. Um, this is a network of five reservoirs in the Pequannock Watershed, which serve as raw water sources to the Pequannock water treatment plants. A hab was observed within Echo Lake and Canister R Reservoir. This grant implemented hab mitigation control and prevention within Echo Lake, the, the Canister Reservoir and the Charlotte, Charlotteburg Reservoir using innovative ultrasonic technology mounted on flower buoys. A sound barrier was formed on the surface of the water, effectively blocking photosynthesis of algae and HABs. Based on the analysis of the water quality and algal parameters, the ultrasonic buoys were effective in preventing the toxin release characteristics of a HAB in, e in Echo Lake. We awarded a grant to the New Jersey Water Supply Authority for $115,600. Um, this grant was completed. This was for the Spruce Run Reservoir Innovative Biochar Installation. <clears throat> the biochar installation on the Mohawkaway Creek near the inlet to the Spruce Run Reservoir to, to capture nutrients before the before they enter the reservoir. The biochar is absorbed burnt plant material, which grabs nutrients from water as it flows over and through the biochar. The biochar was loaded into bags and an anchored into the stream and installed a shadow pools along 250 linear feet of the Mohawkaway Creek in June of 2021. Unfortunately, um, as you can see from the picture, um, this, unfortunately, the biochar installation sustained catastrophic damage during late summer 2021 storms and could not be reinstalled due to significant changes in the pools and riffles in the Mohawkaway Creek. This project was concluded earlier than scheduled without collecting enough data to make appropriate statistical evaluations of the technology's impact on in-stream nutrient removal and subsequent harmful algal blooms inconsistent and persistent in the reservoir downstream. We awarded um, another grant to the Township of Mount Olive, Bud Lake Aquatic Herbicide and Weed Harvesting. In 2019, Bud Lake had its first occurrence of a HAB, which caused the lake to be shut down for lengthy periods of time. Elevated, elevated nutrient levels spurred the growth of noxious blue-green algae, which reduced water clarity, formed green surface scums, and depleted oxygen levels in the lake. The goal of this funding was to explore bud lake conditions prior and after HAB onset, assess HAB development, and test the use of clean green ability to mitigate and control HABs as a less harmful option to aquatic life than copper sulfate. Surveys included visual observation of water clarity, aquatic weeds, and blue-green algae, photoplankton identification and counting, and temperature dissolved oxygen profiles. Overall, the three-year bud lake treatments revealed both positive, negative, or no, or no conclusive results in terms of HABs. These findings support that further efforts are necessary to identify and address the sources of nutrients to bud lake, external inputs possibly coming from sewage systems, runoff or other potential external and internal nutrient loadings and processes, processes need to be assessed and addressed in order to efficiently control HAB development. We awarded a grant to the New Jersey Institute of Technology for $500,000 um, for the me mechanical removal of HABs in lakes using air 
micro nano bubbles and a specialized floating platform. Um, this project is still ongoing. It's mostly completed, but it has not been, final reports have not been submitted yet. Um, in this project, two hab impaired lakes, Branchbrook Park Lake and Deal Lake, were selected as the targeted water bodies for the demonstration sites to evaluate the mitigation, control, and potential prevention of HABs using the proposed multifunctional air flotation boat. This designed air flotation boat or platform uses mechanical means such as air flotation and membrane infiltration to remove HABs from water. Moreover, the aeration of the fine air bubbles uses replenish water quality and potentially mitigate HAB occur occurrences. <clears throat> Again, this project is expected to have final reports completed by the end of by the end of the year. Our the last of the RFP number number one grants, we awarded a grant to the borough of Lake Cop Lake Opacon, one hundred and forty five thousand six hundred eighty dollars. Um, this grant has been closed out. It was for um, aeration, so thirty nine diffusers were distributed throughout Crescent Cove of Lake Copacon. Um, the, implement, the implementation of the aeration system in Crescent Cove correlates to a decreased phosphorus level and blue-green algae levels in the majority of the Cove. Rev residents and borough officials reported sin significantly better conditions. We also, I just wanted to point out some additional grants. Um, in the 2019 RFP number two, we awarded um, we awarded four additional grants. Um, in 20, they were in 2020. They were awarded four additional grants um, for 1.2 million dollars. They were for the Raritan. They were to the Raritan Headwaters Association, the Morris County Parks Commission, um, Lake Hope. Lake Opacon Commission, Swartzwood Lakes and Watershed Association. And then in the 2020-2022 RFP that we that we released, we um, awarded one grant to the city of Newark for $286,400,000. Um, this grant was a continuation of the project that was started in a previous, the previously awarded grant in slide number seven. To continue, you know, to continue that project. Um, in 2022, we also did an RFP for our stormwater lakes management grants. Um, we awarded we awarded five grants specifically for HABs under these grants, which totaled to 2.9 million dollars. Um, the grants were to the Greenwood Lake Commission. Um, Lake Opacon Commission, New Jersey Water Supply Authority had two separate grants for two separate projects and the borough of Florham Park. Um, and lastly, just so I just wanted to, in conclusion, follow up. So in the last four years, the department has awarded 19 grants specifically targeting HABs around the state with a total of $6,718,800. Thank you. And how many cents? <laughs> no, that's really awesome, Catherine. It's really good to see all that money going to such important projects. Thank you for that. Um, and as Catherine hinted at, Next up, we have Bob Schuster, who is DEP's own watershed coordinator, who will be giving you an update on the Rosedale Lake project. And we see slides and no slides. Now, let me stop that one. <laughs> that, was, that, that, that was the other one. Yeah, so many, so many PowerPoints. <laughs> so little time. All right, we're seeing um, the slide. Yep, there you go. Perfect. Thanks, Bob. And another photo for you. Love those. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to be summarizing, you know, a really good project that was done in Rosedale that, that was part of the those HAP grants. Um, just as a background, why was Rosedale one of them? 
Um, they've had annual events since 19, but in 19, they had a pretty large event. And in Tolkozy Lake, that toxin concentration was pretty high. Um, so it, it, it gets these blooms. They're there all the time. And that's why, you know, that was one of the areas where the grant fitted perfect um, to start looking at different ways to mitigate some of these blooms. Um, overall, this project was a really good example, and I think it's going to fit well with a lot of what was talked about in the expert team session, um, where, where they looked at a lot of different things. I think there are things that, you, you know, might be tweaked going forward because they had a lot of good recommendations. Um, this was with the Mercer County um, Park Commission, as well as Watershed Institute and, and their consultants. Um, so it, it, it was a really well done project, did a lot of things, um, and I will summarize them. So they, they, they looked at multiple things in this. So they wanted to look at, you know, an aeration device. They wanted to look at barley bales and constructed floating wetlands. And a lot of this was to decrease the nutrients, but also to decrease toxin formation. Um, so they did a lot of work that was going to be done along those lines to see what could be done and what they were seeing. And for background, this is Rosedale Lake. And there's a couple areas to focus on. There's a tributary that comes in on this north side of the lake and one that comes in on the south side of the lake. And a lot of the nutrient loads that they found were original were originating in those those areas. So they wanted to basically look at all of the nutrients, which was a very key component. A lot of times, you know, you need to get that data to see if any if what they did was effective. And they did that focus on where those nutrient loads were coming in when they were looking at background information they collected. They had, they also looked at the aeration circu circulation systems, which were talked about, um, very good. But they also note that sometimes when you have that cons consistent loading of nutrients, it, it might not have all of the effect you want at reducing the biomass growth. Um, the, the barley bales were at the tributary inlets because that's where a lot of their nutrients, a lot of the, the algae was, was coming from and, you know, to prevent its growth. Um, they had constructed floating wetlands. That was to remove the excess nutrients potentially coming in from those tributary inlets. So there are a lot of different measures being looked at. And then looking at with all of that, they collected a wealth of data after they put all of this in. They did 12 months of monitoring with nutrients. Um, and it really shows what was going on. But they also did the evaluation, which I like to hear, with all those climate conditions we talked about, what's going to happen with climate change. So they were looking at all of those other factors. So the data that they collected was between November 2021 and, and October of 2022. Um, they did not specifically have where it could have been piggybacked a little better was getting the cell counts at the same time as all of that nutrient data that was not done, but they evaluated as as the freshwater and biological monitoring goes out, does their HAB data, they, they're there a lot and they will get that data. So they evaluated it compared to what they were seeing on that. So some of the key things that they found is they, they felt that they didn't have a significant decrease in the overall cell count or a consistent decrease in the microcystin, but it appeared to reduce the frequency of the blooms. Now, this was one year of data that was pointed out that it would be good to, to follow up, but it could have just been due to other factors, but it seemed like they didn't have as many blooms after this was instituted in the frequency and duration. But overall, the, the cell counts when they did have them or the toxin, it, it was inconclusive. It really didn't appear to have an impact. Looking at all of their nutrients, they, they came away with a couple of key conclusions. And I think this goes along with, you know, what Bob Cortman was saying, you know, sometimes that ratio is, in, in the nitrogen analysis, they looked at nitrate plus nitrite, and during the blooms, they would not see it during the last five months after they had some of their blooms. 
but they noticed that there was in those seasons outside of it, there was a lot. And, they, and, and a lot of that seemed to be due to consumption by algae during that, during that productivity. Um, ammonia, they, they noticed they always had peaks elevations throughout that. It's the tributary inlets where they, where they saw these sources coming from. Um, the phosphorus they showed they weren't they, they were consistently elevated and above the surface water quality standard for lakes. What they what they saw though was they didn't see the complete link overall and strong correlation between that and the chlorophyll A, which they would typically see in other locations, which was interesting. But the but the biggest part and where it all ties together is where is that ratio of N to P? You're losing the N, but you always have a lot of P. There's a lot of different factors and why it's important to look at that because the phosphorus levels in in this lake are extremely elevated. Um, they also said that as climate parameters, they, they noticed that when they started to get those warmer rudder, waters really kicking in in May to June, and that's the same time you have those long sun hours for productivity, and they had precipitation in May leading into some of those time periods, all of those factors. So with climate change coming in, as was mentioned by others, what's going to happen with warmer waters with the precipitation patterns? Because with those nutrients and all of those other factors combined really were played a big role in what was going on. Um, they also noted in their own design that a lot of this was measured in the open waters. It was not ideal for monitoring all the efficacy of, of their best management practices. So I think people should think about that. If you're doing a BMP, you might want to have it tweaked a little bit where they where you know you do the monitoring, not just open waters, but maybe some other locations to monitor that that effectiveness. Um, so there, but they also came up with recommendations which go back to what we heard a lot of already is a lot of this, we have to start reducing these loads that are coming in from the watershed. So what about buffer strip, wetland edges, tree plantings, other things that 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 will work along with it. They, they also say you have to evaluate these other sources of in-channel solutions for, for phosphorus loading. Um, and they also look at those, those in-lake solutions which may work very well. Rosedale is not a very big lake, so you know shallow wetlands between existing bank and water surface might help manage stormwater inputs. And then there's always that option, at which we heard a lot of these are to use different you know treatments for for lakes. Um, so the, this was a well-designed project because had a clear objective. They monitored to evaluate the effectiveness. They reported objectively on the effectiveness of the actions. I want to point out to people, not everything may work, and that's that's not a failure. If it doesn't work, we, we learn from that, and that's an important thing that we need to, to think about when doing projects. Um, and, and they evaluated the overall you know, data for the lake health and the nutrient sources. But the, the clear thing is, is making those recommendations of what other things are needed because what they did alone was not gonna work. Um, so with that, that's my contact information. You know, if there's time for questions or at any time, people could reach out to me and to have a discussion. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, all right, next up we have Jen Coffey from ANJAC who is going to be giving us the municipal communi community flair and side of this implementation piece. So Jen, if you are awesome. ready. Thank you. Yeah, let me. Um... Let me find my presentation. <laughs> Looks like it's loading. Okay. And then. Oh, it does appear just to be blank right now. Hmm. If I you want, this, I'm also able to I did share it the it same way you, we did it in practice. <laughs> You're not seeing it yet? No, you maybe try um, sharing and unsharing. I also uh, couldn't see your 
camera either. I couldn't see your face. It also oh. looked. And I also came off camera. I don't know. Uh, you know what? For the sake of time, Chelsea, why don't you share my presentation? Sure thing. And we'll go from there. Let me just get that loaded for you. Team says I'm on camera, but my little light is not on. So, <laughs> bevy of Team's problems this morning. Okay. It should be loading. There you go. And then just give me a quick when to skip. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Oh, does anybody else see them? I see it. Yeah, yes. I see it. Hmm. Very interesting. All right, well. Do you want to try um, just, I guess, Jen, you could try like on your computer, just kind of moving along simultaneously and I'll just let you yeah, know what we'll, slide we're we'll on. Yeah, we'll do that. I'll present blind and check in occasionally <laughs> with you. <laughs> All right, we're on slide it, one. Okay, so uh, let's go to the one that, that has the title for the, the presentation. Today, I'm going to be talking about um, choreographing municipal and community efforts. Uh, for really creating cleaner waters. My name is Jennifer Coffey. I'm the executive director of ANJAC. We'll go to the next slide. ANJAC's mission, in case you don't know what an ANJAC is, we're a nonprofit organization that's been around for 55 years. And mm -hmm. our job is really to yeah. focus on helping. Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. This is the wrong slide. Um, Are uh, you? Do you think you're able to share for her? And because you know, uh, I'm trying it. to find the <laughs> which which she's like skip ahead to the, the, da, da, the da. title, and I cannot find a title. So, um, I think the I last way slide far, was so. the correct one. Here we go. So let me try and share now. Um, I still can't see anybody. <laughs> I do not have the option to share now. I don't have. I'm now getting a message that Teams is not responding. Oh, my goodness. oh no. <laughs> okay, I'll bring the slides back up. Just give, um, give me a slide. Just let me know um, the slide number that I'm supposed to be on. Hold on, hold on, hold and on. And see if I'm you can. Correct, uh, if you're... Sheila, is it not the correct it's presentation? Not the correct one. It's not. Hold on, I said, let's see, community engagement. Okay. And I am sending it to you, Chelsea. Teams wants to restart. I'm going to try to come back. <laughs> okay, yeah, Jen, you want to like quick log yeah. off and then log back on? And then we'll, we'll reboot. All right, and then Sheila, you're also sending it right now? Yeah. Okay, and then... And All right, Sasha, you have a question for someone? Uh, it's, it's more Teams related. Uh, my chat is not working. I don't know if anybody else is. I just didn't want to miss any good information in there. It might be something that's on your organization's end that's limiting. I have some notice that um, people outside your organization may have their own policies on why. So maybe it's something like that. Uh, yes, I had that same notice. I just want to mention that um, I came up as a presenter. Yeah, Is everybody it? should be able to present because um, okay. I wasn't able to limit it to certain people. Oh, OK, fun. So I had to give it to everybody. OK. All right. All right. So how about I try to share again since now I'm back and I think you can see we can me. Ah, we can see on. you. Fantastic. I yes, think this might work. And I record, do have your slides, so I can I really share hate them. Teams. All I right. Share Are you seeing you. that? Yes. There you go. Oh, I don't have to present blind. So I was at a conference and I was all kinds of prepared and had all kinds of backups and the electricity went out. So I hopped up on the table and I started presenting via charades. So maybe this is a little bit better than that. 
Okay, so welcome. My name is Jennifer Coffey. I'm going to try to get you to lunch at some kind of on time here today. So I have the pleasure of serving as the executive director of ANJAC, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions. And now do you see ANJAC's mission statement up on your screen? Anybody? Anybody? Yes. Am I? It's slowly okay. moving to it. Yep. Okay, great. Excellent. So we are, uh, it's going to move slower than I will. So I'll try to slow myself down. ANJAC is a nonprofit organization. We are 55 years uh, strong. And our job really is to support municipal officials, primarily environmental commissioners, but we work with green teams, open space committees, elected officials. We help them make good decisions about the environment for healthy communities. And so uh, there's a couple things that we do. We have a resource center with professional staff, a quarterly magazine, lots of webinars and roundtables. We have two signature events. We just finished our fundamentals course, which is everything you need to know if you find yourself on an EC and go, what the heck is this all about? And how do I review these plans if I'm not an engineer? And uh, how do I comply with the law? We also have a... Uh, a session in the fall called Environmental Congress. So we will have our 51st this year. That'll be on September 27th. So hundreds of our closest friends and followers gather for a day-long educational conference. And we hope to see many of you there. I know some of you have been in the past. We are also uh, an advocate and the voice for environmental commissions in Trenton. So you may see me at the DEP or the legislature's office or around um, the governor's office doing some work. So this is an important slide for all of my environmental commissioners who are out there or anybody who works with environmental commissioners or anyone who wants to let their environmental commissioners know about this. ANJAC has a small grants uh, program and this is really for stewardship. It's for open space stewardship, but we've also done water stewardship projects. So it's an open call right now. It's a maximum of $1,500. So they're small projects. So think buffers and replantings. We've had some water chestnut removal projects. Um, check out our website if anything that I say or anything you hear today looks inspiring and you think maybe I need a little seed money to get something going or to match a DEP grant. So I want to talk a little bit about water quality, a little bit about regulations and how we tie that all together with communities. And so this is something that Katie and Chelsea and I have talked a good bit about in terms of who's responsible for water quality, right? Whose job is it? And one of the things that I hear that is often frustrating to me as somebody who works to inspire and support environmental commissioners and somebody who serves on my own township's planning board is that an application for development will come along and I hear, oh, well, if there's any impacts on the environment, the DEP will handle it. No, no, it's not just the DEP's job. And in many cases, when we're talking about local development, and what happens on the land affects water, we're talking about municipal responsibility. And there is no role for DEP in many, many, many cases. DEP is involved in big projects, significant projects, but not your everyday projects and your death by a thousand cuts that is going to impact water quality. It is municipal responsibility, county responsibility, schools, residents, it is everybody. And so this is, this is a slide I use to, or I've developed to, to talk to environmental commissioners. And, you know, we didn't do a poll today, but I'll just walk through these questions real quick. If development is going to happen, which one of these is false? If development is going to happen and impact water quality, the DEP will handle it. Maybe, depends if there's a flood hazard area permit or a wetlands permit, but not all of the issues. Stormwater management is my municipal engineers responsibility. They don't want me involved. It, it's all theirs. I hear that time and time again. That's that's wrong. They have an absolute role. It's really important for engineers to be involved, but it's important for everybody else to be involved. And flooding and water quality are such a big problem. There's nothing I can do about it as an environmental commission member or a volunteer or a green team member. Well, that's absolutely not true. We've seen lots of great projects today. I'm going to talk about a few of them as well. This is everybody's problem and everybody's concern. We all want clean water. We all need clean water. We're all hyper concerned when we hear something has happened to our clean water. And so the time to take action is before there's a big problem. And so taking action on HABs, 
has a lot of co-benefits. And I could come at this presentation from talking about habitat quality or drinking water quality or climate resilience. Because the great thing is that when we all work together to protect water quality, we have lots of other benefits. It's not a siloed action. So if you are working on buffer plantings that are going to reduce nutrient input, you're also then working on soil stability. And you may be creating pollinator habitat if you use the right plants. And you're also making your community look better. So you get all these great co-benefits. So if you are an environmental commission member or a local elected official, or a DPW member, and you're thinking about applying for a grant, and you're thinking, I, I need something that addresses specifically bacteria, try to think a little more broadly and think about habitat projects, soil stability, climate resiliency, because it just matters what end of the prism you're looking through to get to your end results. There are lots of co-benefits when we do environmental work. And as we've heard today, that there are um, really two controlling factors when it comes to whether you get a HAB or not. One is the climate crisis. We've got increasing temperatures and we can do something about increasing temperatures, but it's going to take us a long time. Right? It took us a long time to get into this situation where we're seeing hotter summers and much, much warmer winters, which is where we're really seeing the impact of increased temperature, which allows HABs to thrive throughout the winter. They're not getting knocked back by super cold and thick ice. And, um, you know, we're seeing them thrive year round and then really pop up to elevated levels of concern in the summer. So temperature is a big one. But nutrient control is where we can have a bigger impact in the more immediate timeline. So phosphorus in particular, as you have heard and will continue to hear. So I want to encourage you, one, if you're an environmental commission member, green team member, community volunteer, et cetera, et cetera, use the DEP's resources. They have put this all together for you. We consulted and reviewed a lot of it. They had other people who are water quality experts from Watershed Institute and other places look at this material. Use what they have. It's already pre-formatted. You can print it out and you can bring it to your table that you have at your farmer's market that you have at your community event, you have at your Earth Day event, you've got at your Memorial Day event, you get the picture. There are lots of spring fling events, lots of farmers markets, lots of summer fairs, lots of fall harvest festivals that are happening over the next six months where environmental commissions, green teams, municipal officials, um, high school and college clubs are interacting with the public. So use the DEP resources to find out if you have had a HAB in your community, because then you are much more likely to have it again, because you know it's already present. And you can do a lot of education to talk about how people can reduce the potential for having a HAB. And again, lots and lots of co-benefits to doing things like minimizing lawn fertilizer, picking up your pet waste, making sure your septic system is functioning, maintaining or doing buffer plantings. Again, Anjak's got a small grant available right now um, that would be great for that kind of work. They have got this formatted for you to print out eight and a half by 11s, to print out palm cards. They've got QR card, QR code. So anything you could possibly want to talk about a HAB, especially if you're not a HAB scientist, which I'm not, uh, that they've got it there for you. So take advantage of those materials. So what can communities do? One, I say to environmental commissions, and we really try to encourage uh, throughout our Fundamentals for Effective Environmental Commissioners course, which we just completed last week. That's our spring training, our EC boot camp. All the sessions either are or will soon be on our YouTube channel, so check us out there. Get to know your municipal staff. ECs often meet in the evening and DPW staff are around during the day. DPW staff are taking care of the parks. If you've done a project like a rain garden or a pollinator garden, they're the ones out there taking care of it. You really want to make sure you're communicating with them so they don't mow over your work. Um, and I have seen DPW staff get so excited and engaged in caring for green infrastructure projects and plantings. We've got a few ECs who do something as simple as an annual pizza party. So they just get together with EC, green team, DPW, and they 
they get to know each other's names. They exchange cell phone numbers so they can contact one another. If you want to go to the next level, talk about what your goals are in the municipality that year. Get to know your staff because DPW, elected officials, and ECs all need to move in the same direction when it comes to protecting and restoring water quality. Not just because it's the right thing to do, not just because we don't want glowing green waters and we want to swim in them and have fun, but also because it's the law now. So there's something called an MS4 permit, and I could do a whole day on MS4 permits, but we're not going to. An MS4 permit is your municipal separate storm sewer permit, and I'm sure most of you here know about this, but there are lots of requirements, and ECs are a great opportunity to engage and help municipalities fulfill their requirements. So you're getting value added to your municipality, you're getting expertise, and you're getting what's legally required of you now in terms of your MS4 permit. So just the community outreach and education. Again, DEP's got tons of information. You can also ask ANJAC. We've got lots of resources. We can get you games and displays for your community tables, for your Earth Day events, your community events, your, your summer events. Um, in your MS4 permit, one of the other things that needs to be done is mapping, monitoring, and maintenance of stormwater outfalls and stormwater infrastructure. And so what can be done is ECs can then team up with scouts, with high school honors clubs, with high school environmental clubs, college clubs, and really start to work towards getting this work done that's required regulatorily. Why is that important? Well, because if stormwater infrastructure and stormwater management facilities are failing, that's an extra added input of potential pollution into the watershed system. Lots of great projects are being done by ECs. So there's adopt a drain program. You saw on the previous slide, Patterson um, had, we're trying to, to inspire them and give them the resources they need to get it going again. But Berkeley Heights, uh, Berkeley Heights has a, an adopt the drain program. This is about cleaning out the catchment system or cleaning out the, um, the stormwater drains. And uh, often this is done right before there's a big rainfall to make sure that the system is functioning at peak capacity, um, but it can be done year round as well. Again, educational events. I love, love, love when ECs engage artists because it, it really draws attention in a beautiful way to this infrastructure that's often invisible to us unless it fails, right? We don't see it unless it doesn't work. And so um, just a, a quick story. I grew up in Philly and we knew, I'm using air quotes in case you can't see me, that if you threw your garbage down the drain, it got filtered out later. It didn't, it went right into the Delaware. So I'm on like my 30th year of paying penance for throwing garbage down the storm drain because I didn't know any better. So this kind of education is incredibly important to dispel myths and draw attention to uh, infrastructure. And Jack works a lot with municipalities on bigger projects so with municipal officials and ECs, lots of different um, organizations do these kind of projects. So if you're not in connection with your Watershed Institute, your Raritan Headwaters, your Highlands Coalition, your Pinelands Preservation Alliance, et cetera, et cetera, talk to them, connect with them, because we have access to applying for larger grants from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, from EPA, and sometimes these grants are too big or almost too big for us to even handle. So we know it's too big of an administrative hurdle for ECs to manage, but we want to partner with you. We want to put in these larger green infrastructure projects that then you, and again, the new relationships you've created with your DPW can then care for moving forward. So we'll do curb cuts on parking lots. And we will manage stormwater that was unmanaged before. So you're getting um, flooding control, you're getting nutrient control, you're getting pollinator habitat, you're getting some really happy kids who are out there planting um, and some happy municipal officials and better relationships between the EC and the municipal official when you can say, look, we're bringing money value added to your town. Um, we're not asking you for a whole lot of money, just some DPW support, and the mayor can come out and um, cut a ribbon, and it's a really feel-good opportunity. Again, uh, we did a rain garden up in Phillipsburg. We've done dozens and dozens of these. Uh, there are projects with ECs working on um, stabilizing shorelines to minimize sediment runoff, nutrient reduction, create habitat. So ECs and volunteers can do an enormous amount of work. 
This year, ANJAC is specifically working with communities in South Jersey to install uh, up to five different rain gardens. Uh, we're hoping to get them all done before mid next year. So keep a keep a lookout on this work. And we've got a couple other grant projects in the in the hopper. Um, whoops, I went too fast. Go back. One of the other things ECs and green teams can do is really focus on what we call landscape makeover in partnership with the Pinelands Preservation Alliance. So check out that site. That's Anjak and Pinelands and a couple other groups working together to transform landscapes. So again, phosphorus is a, a big issue, a big nutrient to control in terms of limiting HAPs. And phosphorus is something that we see on new lawns, or you're supposed to have had a soil test to apply phosphorus to your lawns. Honestly, I'm not so sure how well that's being complied with in terms of what landscapers are doing. So what we've transitioned to talking about from a nonprofit perspective is really focusing on transitioning your lawn away from that monoculture um, grass that's not native to here, doesn't provide any habitat value, doesn't give you any um, stormwater control or nutrient uptake, and to do something better with it, to put some native plants on there. And so we've got some seed money to help residents do that. Rutgers works with us to hold um, design landscape makeover webinars. And if it's a bigger project, they've got some seed money to actually do redesign projects for you to help you better manage stormwater on your property. So check out, you can just, um, you could just Google landscape makeover and Anjak or landscape makeover and Pinelands and you'll, you'll find it. There's lots of other projects like this as well. River Friendly is something the Watershed Institute has, and I know other organizations have adopted. So um, really check out converting your lawn area if it's possible um, for your municipal complex, for your library, for your firehouse, for your police station, if you're an EC, and if not, promoting it for our residents. Um, it's a real feel-good project and um, an opportunity to connect residents in a way that makes links between what their hands are in and the water quality that we're all talking about and concerned about. So again, this is just a reminder that Anjax got some seed money available. Um, we are taking applications right now. It's a simplified proposal. We don't want to read 10 pages of narrative. It's a very simple application uh, and we'll be giving out grants up to $1,500 to kind of support the projects that I talked about on the smaller scale, um, as well as anything else creative and innovative you've got. And if you have questions, I want to talk about your project and see if it's uh, potentially eligible. You can email us at info at .org. I'm sure Sheila will put that in the chat at info at .org. Um, We appreciate all of your support. Please check out our resources. We've got um, our ANJAC report online. Follow us on Facebook and um, Instagram and check out our upcoming programs. I wanted to highlight particularly the first one. Sheila will be doing this on April 4th. It's in partnership with the DEP. This is on the Essex Hudson Greenway. So we're doing a community information session um, and then lots of other good programming throughout the year as well. So I think I, yes, I'm at 19 minutes. I got in under my 20 minutes, Chelsea. So that was that's all I have for now. And I'm happy to to hang out for a little while if there are any questions. Yeah, that was incredible. Thanks, Jen. Lots of information packed in there. Um, really important work uh, connecting the locals and the community. Um, and I'm sure we, we do have time for like one or two quick questions and then I'm sure folks can contact you um, and, and, and Jack if they have uh, further questions. But we'll Absolutely. open it up for like one or two questions and then we'll take a break for lunch. Everybody's like, I just want to get to lunch. Okay, any hands? I'm not seeing any. Okay, all right. Thank you guys. With that, I'm going to take a, a pause, come back for lunch. Uh, someone suggested that 
you know, I don't know, maybe it, it helps logging off and logging back on <laughs> after lunch might might help with any issues, but I don't know, we're, we're making it through. <laughs> Worked uh, for me. I had yeah, to go away and come it, back. So. <laughs> it, it finally worked, so it's great. All right, so, oh, we do have one quick question. Uh, Robert Ever, Everville? Oh, you're, you're muted. How can you? Okay, go ahead. Uh, it's a relatively simple question. You're really low, Robert. Are you near your mic? I am. There, you, that's a little better. Mic. Can you hear me now? It's a little better. Not much. How's that? All right, just talk uh, loudly. I turned my volume uh, all the way up. So. My question is this. Uh, there are lots of places to put your money. Uh, most of them have a positive effect. But how often do you, in these analyses, consider cost effectiveness? In other words, dollars per pound or dollars per kilogram of this or that removed from the uh, the lake's nutrient load. I will try to answer that and then defer to some of the technical experts. I will say after having done this work for about 25 years now, it is always more effective to prevent harm before it's happened. So if you know you've got an area area where um, you're, you've got treated lawn with some fertilizer running off directly into a stream, if you get some native plants on there and you get some buffers and you stabilize that soil, that's going to be more efficient than having to go back later and try to fix damage or harm that has occurred, in my experience. And I think that was an extremely broad question that was difficult to answer. And I think Jen said it really perfectly. And that really is like the, the cheapest way to go at it is to prevent it from happening in the first place. So with that, I'm going to close this down for lunch and we will be back at 1 p.m. sharp. So thanks, guys. See you soon. So you should be seeing the ITRC webpage. There we go. All right, cool. and it is officially one o'clock. So welcome back. I hope I hope folks are are out there listening um, and not still back at the lunch table. Uh, but anyway, we have with us our DEP's Hab guy, Dr. Rob Newby. He's going to be giving us a little overview of some cool tools and stuff. So fire away, Rob. All right. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you had an enjoyable lunch break. Um, and as Chelsea said, I am um, Rob Newby. I'm sure many on this call know who I am. Um, but for those who don't, I am a microbiologist with the Division of Science and Research uh, in DEP. Uh, my job and my role has been trying to understand how these harmful algal blooms are occurring and some of the ways in which we can um, you know, apply very various different mitigation factors to control them and to sort of prevent their reoccurrence. So um, I was asked to present on some of the tools and some of the things that we use um, and some of the things that are out there publicly for you to sort of look at how um, some of the science has evolved over time. So the first thing I'm going to present is actually something from a product um, from a group called ITRC, which is the Interstate Technology Regulatory Council. And it's a group made up of um, various states, federal, tribal, and stakeholders. So this was a document that was drafted back in 2018 um, and then was revised further in 2020. Um, so there's HCB1 and HCB2, and there's a little bit of nuance between it. So HAB is just a general term to describe any kind of overgrowth of anything photosynthetic, any photosynthetic microbe in an aquatic system. But you might see the term HCB, which stands for harmful cyanobacteria bloom, just to help designate the difference. Because you can have blooms of algae, you can have blooms of diatoms, you can have blooms of other things that are photosynthetic that are not cyanobacteria. And depending on you know what your level of interest is, so if you're, let's say you are a reservoir manager, a bloom of diatoms or a bloom of algae might be more uh, more harmful in regards to your, your treatment strategy than it would be for something like cyanobacteria. So to help designate that, you might see the term HCB used in place of HAB, um, but in regards to everything, you know, it they they're pretty much identical. So 
the resource I'm showing you now is the um, HCB1 document, which deals with the planktonic cyanobacteria. So you can find cyanobacteria either throughout the water column, or you can find them all the way at the very, very bottom attached to something, and that's called benthic cyanobacteria. We don't know a whole lot about uh, benthic cyanobacteria or the harm that they represent, but we are finding out more. So they, they sort of split the document to two, uh, two two versions, planktonic, which is HCB1, and benthic, which is HCB2. Um, so what I'm going to show you basically is just the guidance document that was put out from the ITRC work group. So in regards to some things that are really particularly useful, um, we can click on things like what do blooms look like? And this is the question that we get quite often is, is that, you know, we will typically get pictures or we'll get some sort of visual indication. Um, and we get asked like, you know, is this a cyanobacteria bloom? And there are some really low cost or no cost tests that you can do to help differentiate between whether it's a cyanobacteria bloom or if it's like an algae bloom, a true algae bloom or a diatom bloom. And this guide gives you an overview of all those different things. So if we go to, let's say the monitoring strategy portion. So we can click on this and we can go to um, how to develop a monitoring strategy. So what should you even be looking for? Additionally, you can see some of the key terms that we use in regards to where we find cyanobacteria, right? So you can find them near the shoreline. You can find them even evenly distributed throughout the, um, the water layers. You can find them in the metalimnion, which is the middle layer. You can find them at a specific area in the photo, the photic zone. You can have them completely distributed from top to bottom. Um, and then we can even see blooms under ice, right? And each one of those things represents sort of a different category in regards to our monitoring strategies. We have some pictures, which are really cool. You can kind of see the distribution of what benthic cyanobacteria look like compared to what your planktonic cyanobacteria blooms would look like. Um, here is a good sort of uh, flow chart for how you can conduct monitoring and what kind of monitoring you can do, right? So screening, testing for potentially cyan toxic cyanobacteria, and then the actual testing for the toxins. And um, Jason had talked about this a little bit earlier with some of the molecular things like the qPCR, so the genetic aspect of things, right? Um, you can see sort of the idea here is that, you know, if something is qualitative or quantitative, whether it's giving you kind of a yes, no type thing, or whether it's giving you actual data, right? Actual numerical based data, right? And basically the turnaround time as well. So this is a tremendously great resource if you're trying to build a strategy to, incor to incorporate what things you might want to sort of have in that for monitoring, right? And then it tells you basically all the different things in terms of relative costs, right? So visual assessments, your eyes are free, right? We're, we're all born with them, right? So we can visually assess like from what we understand of what blooms typically present, we can look to see, does this appear to be a cyanobacteria bloom, right? The only problem is, is that there's limitations behind that, right? So sometimes blooms will present differently given nutrient demand, given, you know, age of the bloom. So visual is not always going to be a tried and true thing, but it is a good way to sort of filter out whether it is something more noxious. So something like duckweed, if you look at a body of water that has a, a you know, entire green lawn on top of it, and you're able to sort of see that they're individual little plants, that's not how cyanobacteria typically will present themselves. So you can rule out the fact that it's, you know, uh, cyanobacteria versus something like, you know, an aquatic plant, right? Additionally, like there's things like the jar and stick test. This is also something that was typically done cyanobacteria because they maintain their, uh, their ability to, in the, to float in the water column. So what they'll do is that you can basically collect this sample, allow it to sit, and if it settles down, it's most likely not cyanobacteria. If it rises to the top, it most likely is a cyanobacteria species. But again, there's limitations behind all of this. More importantly, and I think what I think is um, something that is of use to a number of individuals is this um, remediation and man or, sorry, man management and control strategies guide. So we're often asked, you know, is there a sort of like one size catch all? Is there something that we can do when there is a bloom that's present, right? And unfortunately in this world or in this, this realm, there is no one size management strategy that's going to work for every single bloom. So when you're presented with a bunch of options, how do you pick which one is going to be the best? How do you pick one, one, which one is going to you know, work for you given your, your, your situation? And we encourage everyone that is you know, faced with this question to consult a certified lake management company to discuss with them based on your body of water, the potential 
options you have in terms of treatment and prevention. But if you're given a list of things and you know you don't know what they are, this is a great resource for you to look up and see, you know, one, you know, where has it been applied before? Two, what's the estimated cost? Right. And this was based in 2020 dollars. So obviously, you know, four years of inflation and other things have you know changed some of this. So, you know, but you can get a rough idea as to how much like one of these treatment options would cost. But the really cool thing is, is that you can basically get a list of all of these, you know, kind of given to you right away. Um, and it lists out all the different strategies that have been peer reviewed by the ITRC work group. So all of these represent various different strategies that have been can, have been evaluated scientifically by ITRC because, you know, they basically are either um, tried and true. There are some emerging technologies and they you know call them out specifically saying, hey, like, you know, at the time of publication, there wasn't a lot of data. So if you wanted to explore something more, you can definitely explore something um, more. But I had mentioned in the chat that there's different options for oxygenation. And, you know, we're lucky that we have, you know, Bob Cortman on the call, who is one of the experts in aeration. So, um, but all of these different things that, you know, might be, might be presented for you as a possibility for treatment, you can look up here and you can understand a little bit behind those different strategies. Um, and they have case studies as well. So if we click on, let's say, hypomimetic oxygenation and aeration, which Aeration works for some systems to help prevent blooms, but in other systems, you know, it won't be the only solution that you have to apply, right? But you can kind of see here, there's a bunch of different things, like how effective it is, um, what's the nature of the bloom. So if it's a repeating event that you constantly get, um, if it has both toxin and non-toxin species, right? Um, and does it present, does it target just cyanobacteria or is it just all photosynthetic microorganisms? That's really something that's of, of, of uh, importance to know because you don't want to alter the community too much by applying a strategy because you don't want the system to have to try to try to you know overreact and overcorrect. So you can see here cost analysis, and then usually there's a case study, so regulatory, and here's the case study, which shows you, you know, the example of where one of these technologies has been applied before. So this link is available publicly. There's also training videos as well. So if you wanted to go through the entirety of this, there's training videos that are available, you know, through the ITRC um, group. They've been recorded and they also hold training sessions. So the next training session, I believe, is going to be later on this year. Um, but you can you can subscribe to the ITRC uh, website and they'll alert you when there's various different trainings that are available. So. With that, I'm also going to show you another tool that we use in the last five minutes that I have, and that is the EPA Cyan um, app. And this was something that was talked about this morning from our two guests from EPA. So the EPA Cyan app is a collaborative, collaborative effort between federal agencies. In particular, it's a collaborative effort between NASA, USGS, and EPA. It's an EPA product, but it's something that is done in collaboration with other federal agencies. So what this app is, is it's taking satellite data that is passing over most water bodies twice a week. And what it's doing is it's looking specifically for the presence of a pigment that most cyanobacteria have, or almost all cyanobacteria have. And that's the phycocyanin protein. And that was something that we had talked about a little bit um, with the with the, the meter loan program, right, the fluorometers. So the satellite is sensing that pigment in water bodies. There's a lot of limitations with this data. They are trying to expand it, but one of the biggest limitations is, is that you need to have a 300 by 300 meter resolvable pixel that doesn't have surrounding land around it. So small water bodies often aren't able to be fully resolved with this app, but it's still a really good tool so you can get an, an idea as to what's going on. So. If you go on to the link that's being shown here, um, you're able to sign up for a free account and you're able to drop these pins. And you can kind of see here that I have kind of a hodgepodge of different you know, pins throughout the state. Um, because of the way that this is um, divided, the state's divided in half, basically from around the, the Trenton line south is one grid and then from Trenton north is a second grid. So if we click on one of these, we can actually view the latest image from the satellite. And this is telling you or showing you what um, the satellite is reading as cyanobacteria detections, right? So you can kind of see what I'm talking about here, how from the Trenton line south, it's a different tile, but from here in north, it's a you know one resolvable tile. So if we zoom in, so right now I am showing you 
um, Manasquan Reservoir. This is a color-coded scale going from blue all the way up to red. Blue meaning there's a slight detection. And as you get from sort of like blue to green to yellow to red, um, it means that there's more cyanobacteria cells detected. So you can see that from here, um, some of the information, it's a little bit tricky sometimes too, and I apologize. Um, you can actually get you know, comparison. So if I wanted to compare this water body to another water body, I can compare my locations. Right, so I can compare, select to compare. I can compare between those two pixels what the cyanobacteria cell count is. And it gives me something really cool, it gives me this blooming chart so I can see historically what the detection of cyanobacteria was from the satellite and when it was. And this represents kind of an example of what we would typically sort of expect to see that during the growing season, there's a lot more detections than when we have non-photosynthetic activity. So during the winter time, there's a little bit of a lull. And you can see based on this, this is measuring you actual sort of cell counts or estimated cell counts. Um, you can go back to a map, you can input you know, different uh, grids, but you can basically get, as it zooms all the way into the bottom of the water body for whatever reason, um, you can get some you know, really cool information from it. So if, for larger water bodies, you can actually drop multiple pins in there to see, you know, is the bloom moving or migrating? The only thing I will add is that there's a little bit of delay from when the satellite passes over to when the data is actually available and fully resolvable. So you might have a, you know, a bit of, an, of a lag from when you would expect, but you can click on the, the dot and it could tell you like when that image which actually was last there. So the last time that there was something there was about a week ago, which kind of, or about a week and a half ago, which makes sense because we've been hitting, getting all that rain, a lot of cloud cover will affect this, right? So there's a number of different tools that are available. And this is one of the ones that we use, particularly during the summer to help us, you know, sort of get like a really higher level overview if there is a bloom present in water bodies or not. And then we can conduct follow-ups based on that. Um, the cell counts are, again, estimates. These are not exact cell counts. So one of the things to keep in mind is that if you do see something and something does pop up in the satellite data, to always conduct an actual field assessment um, just so that you can ensure that, the, you know, what you're seeing is, tr you know, sort of true or ha has already been sort of um, detected. And with that, that is all that I have. Um, and, you know, I will answer questions in the chat. And actually, Rob, we but thank you for that. But we have a couple minutes if anybody wants to ask Rob a question. Feel free and raise your hand. You know, there were. I see. So from Rebecca, the um, it's the OLCI satellite. It's the Sentinel three satellite. I want to say is the satellite that they're using. Um, that's the sensor that they're currently using. They're looking to ex expand that out. Um, there, there was an effort to use, um, I, th I can't remember what the satellite was, but it was the same one that USGS uses for their their um, total vegetation sensor. Um, so there is, you know, there's a number of different things, but they are, like, like we heard this morning, they are trying to expand it because that sensor does have a limitation of 300 by 300 meters. So they're hoping to get it down to 10 by 10. So better resolution. And I see. Um, Heather? Hi, Rob. Um, just a question of how do you think that that data would not be possibly indicating any false positives? Like how reliable do you think that is? Yeah, so that that's something that comes up a lot. Um, and this is why I always say you want to you want to ground truth what you see with this data. Right. So, um, you know, it's possible that there is some reflect because it's basically measuring this on an angle. So there might be reflective issues, too. So. When the satellite passes over, it's not aiming straight down, it's aiming at an angle. So there might be some reflectivity issues that are coming back to us, which you know why you know larger water bodies are less of an issue because you get more pixels and it's able to kind of you know verify what it's reading. Um, so it's possible, and I, I you know I showed the Manasquan reservoir here. It's possible that there's actually no detections there. It just happens to be an artifact from when you know the satellite passed over. Um, so again, like you know, whenever we get a detection here, we try to always, you know, either follow up with stakeholders or we try to, you know, collect in the sample ourselves to verify what you're seeing. The additional thing is that there might actually be a bloom at the metalimnion. Um, so there is some penetrance of the satellite imagery or the satellite reflectance. So it is able to see a little bit below the water. So there might be a bloom that's lurking that's just bouncing up and down, but it's not getting to the top um, of the water column. So you're not quite seeing that, but it is catching it um, just because it, the 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 depth that it's able to see is able to see the cells or able to see the pigment of the cells. 
All right, we've got time for one last question from Val. Uh, yes, I uh, often concern myself with where a bloom is at a given point in time over the course of a day. And you've mentioned this in these presentations today, but I tend to go after hot spot exposures as a primary concern. And that can change from morning to night, it can be on one side of the lake and then on the other. Um, so I wonder if there's a tendency to look at that, if there's a, a, a way that it, the directions for sampling covers that need. And the morning systems, you know, you might not have much there one day, but the next day it might change quite a bit. Right. And I th we, we definitely see that trend with our real-time monitor buoys. We can actually see the cells moving up and down in the water column. So, this, so the, the, um, the probe sits about a meter down from the water, water surface. And you can see, you know, kind of like a diurnal pattern where the cells are, you know, moving up and down through the water column, especially during like, you know, summer days. Um, so, you know, if you have the ability to, you know, fix a sensor in place and, you know, measure at that point, you can at least catch the cells as they're moving up and down. In terms of spatial sampling, in terms of trying to manage that risk, it's all going to depend on what you're sort of, you know, trying to monitor. If you're trying to monitor for recreational exposure, bathing beaches, boat launch, Launches, places where the public are going to be exposed are going to be where you're mostly going to be concentrating and monitoring compared to like open water. Open water definitely will will have a you know have some detection if there's a massive bloom, but it might not be as high of a number as you would have for those more shallow areas where you have a boat launch or you know bathing beach. So you build your monitoring strategy, and that's one of the things that the ITRC um, monitoring document talks about is you know how do you build that strategy based on what you're what you're trying to monitor, right? Um, and what what level of risk you're trying to sort of you know measure for or against. Thank you. Oh, now, Vic. 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 <laughs> yeah, I just want to add to that, Rob. Our our um, um, sampling is a is in it's a response strategy. So we are sampling. You know, when we do go out to sample, we sample the most concentrated area. So our alerts represent like the worst case scenario to uh, protect the public better. Um, if we do go to a site that has um, you know, the tab might be concentrated in one area and there's a beach also like in another area of the lake. We'll sample the beach also as a precaution. And then, you know, we'll do that each time we go out to sample again subsequently to check the status. If there's a beach, we'll always check the beach. If we know of a drinking water source downstream of a of a hab concentration upstream, we'll also check along that reach uh, to make sure there's no threat to the drinking water source. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, up next, we have Dr. Fred Lovnow, and he's a senior technical director from Princeton Hydro, going to talk to you a little bit about overwintering cyanobacteria and how to quantify them. All right. Can everyone hear me and see this? Absolutely. Great. Good on both. All right. Thank you. So yeah, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm learning an awful lot today. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, quantifying overwintering cyanobacteria. I mean, obviously, we're very familiar with the impacts of these HABs, particularly during the summer season and their economic impacts, uh, their recreational impacts, ecological impacts. Um, and uh, this is Lake Apacon, largest lake in New Jersey. It straddles Morris and Sussex County. And this is our 30 year database of surface water temperatures at the Mid Lake Station in July. And not surprising, we've seen a statistically significant increase in the surface water temperatures. Uh, however, something we also uh, looked at was in one of the shallow sections of the lake. So this is in the River Sticks Crescent Cove section of the lake. So only two meters deep, we took all of the temperature readings uh, taken immediately over the sediments. Uh, so this is about two meters deep. And again, you can see statistically significant increase in temperature immediately over those sediments. In addition to that, over the last few years, we've had some pretty ice-free conditions over the last few winters. So Donna from the Lake Apacon Foundation took this, uh, these photos. This is from uh, early 2023. Uh, January, people were actually boating on the lake, which is sort of unheard of. Uh, and then in February, there was a thin layer of ice that did not last very long. 
And then even this winter, uh, so this photo was taken by Marty Kane, again from the Lake Apacon Foundation. Um, and while we had some pretty cold uh, ice over conditions early in January, again, they did not last. By February, uh, the lake was ice free. Um, so, you know, what these conditions do is they essentially make it more conducive for algae in general, whether it's algae or cyanobacteria, to grow. Um, and the one thing I want to emphasize is uh, we always think of, of the, the benthic filamentous algae growing from the sediments up. Uh, and one of the reasons why they do that, um, as soon as there's light available, there, there tends to be more nutrients at that sediment water interface, but also the planktonic uh, forms of cyanobacteria, the, the free floating ones that make the surface scums over the summer season. A lot of them orig originate from this sediment water interface as well. So I, I do want to distinguish between planktonic cyanobacteria. So these are the ones that are free floating. They can give the water that wet green paint appearance. Um, some of them have gas vacuoles, so they can move uh, quickly up and down the water column, but they do tend to concentrate in near shore areas, uh, very frequently in beach areas, marinas. Um, but the majority of these cells do in fact originate from the sediments. And then we have the, the benthic cyanobacteria. So this is more of the, I, I call it like the green cotton candy, the, the filamentous mats that form along the bottom. Uh, and they'll accumulate uh, and then as they grow, um, they will accumulate oxygen. Uh, they may underneath have some carbon dioxide, but they become buoyant and then those mats can float to the surface as well. Um, but the point is, is whether it's a planktonic form or a benthic form, such as Lingbia, uh, which is a really problematic um, uh, cyanobacteria that grows primarily over that sediment water interface, they do have the potential to get into the water column and have some negative impacts. And this is just showing you two filaments, one of a benthic form, Lingbia, and then the one in the back is Dolictospermum, uh, which is a planktonic form of cyanobacteria. Um, so you have this interaction um, between active and inactive, both benthic and pelagic or, or free floating algae. And this, this dynamic can really vary depending on what water body uh, you're, you're dealing with, the area within the water body, as well as the prevailing weather conditions. Um, so one of the things that we've actually been interested in over the last few years is, you know, we've been seeing these cyanobacteria blooms the cyanobacteria have been showing up earlier in the season and the blooms have been lasting further and further into fall where sometimes we see these blooms persist into early December. So we wanted to get a sense of the, uh, of the overwintering of these cyanobacteria. And there are really two major ways they can overwinter. There are aconites, which are basically um, resting spores um, that are resilient against uh, variations in the environment, but they, they're basically uh, resting cells that will lie over the sediments and then they can re-germinate uh, once conditions are more favorable for the cyanobacteria. And then there are vegetated cells, which are cells or colonies that will remain along the bottom. They may be active or semi-active. Uh, and I'll show you examples of those. And so here's Here's a aconite, what, what an aconite looks like, one of those resting spores. Um, one of our wetland scientists did an illustration of an aconite hatching. I described it to her and she made that illustration. Uh, thank you, Ivy. Um, and in Lake Apacon specifically, two of the most dominant cyanobacteria over the last few years have been two that are planktonic and they have gas vacuoles so they can move up and down the water column fairly quickly. So we have Dolictospermum and Anfanazomenon. And Anfanazomenon is one of those that is a little more tolerant of cooler water temperatures. So um, this time of year, if we're seeing any cyanobacteria very frequently, it's Anfanazomenon. Um, also um, in Lake Apacon over the last few years, we've, we've been finding um, a, 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 a genus of cyanobacteria. It used to be called Cylindrospermopsis. It's a subtropical species, but we started seeing it in Lake Apacon around 2020. But I believe New Jersey DEP started seeing it maybe a, a few years before that. But it's an invasive cyanobacteria that's been moving into temperate systems. And it, it, it blooms very quickly when the temperatures are high and it crashes very quickly when the temperatures cool down. It also produces aconites. Um, but this is how this life cycle of these cyanobacteria that have aconites live. So during the winter, you have these resting spores. Spring, 
uh, uh, we go from winter to spring, we have warmer temperatures, more light, uh, the, uh, the lake mixes, uh, we'll have this germination, uh, we have the cells growing, you can see that summer on the top, and then once we get later in the summer into the fall, stress conditions reform the aconites, and then they settle to the bottom. That top area that says growing filaments, that section over the decades has been increasing in terms of the duration over the course of the year. Uh, and so it's again, it's not just aconites. Um, microcystis is known to overwinter. Um, it can survive for months without light or oxygen. Um, more than likely, it's temperature that reactivates it, and I'll show some some data from a, from a paper to, sh to to explain that. Um, but wind-induced mixing really helps to resuspend these colonies back into um, the water column. And, and 10, 15 years ago, microcystis was one of those general that would just, as soon as temperatures got cold, it would disappear. Now we're seeing it sort of linger on uh, or show up earlier in the season. Um, this is some data uh, from a, uh, a reservoir, a drinking water supply in northern New Jersey. We collected this data in January uh, of this year, and the, the values are just cyanobacteria cell counts as cells per mil. The numbers in parentheses are the number of aconites per mil. And two things I want to point out. One is, is you, and not surprising, in January, most of the aconites were down along the bottom, right at that sediment water interface. So those numbers in parentheses show that at all three sampling stations, the aconites were at the bottom. But what was really interesting is if you look at that northwest inlet, which was the shallowest sampling station, mid-depth, you see that little M there next to the 988. Uh, a good chunk of the cyanobacteria identified at that station were microcystis, which is again kind of surprising this early in January to see that genus in the water column. So, um, doing a little, you know, uh, research into some papers, um, microcystis it will overwinter in the sediments under colder conditions. Um, it though can get into the water column for short durations if the water column gets slightly warmer, say around 12 degrees Celsius. Uh, and obviously the rising temperatures in the water column will promote more of that open water growth. Uh, and it actually accelerates the death of colonies that are still in the sediment. So this is some research that's been recently published to show that, you know, microcystis isn't just this planktonic form of algae. It does have the this both benthic and this pelagic uh, component to it. Um, so we've been interested in this for the last few years. This is just showing you in 2023, I've asked so, uh, some of our uh, staff to, um, you know, just let me know whether you've seen aconites or not in the samples that we were looking at for 2023. And of the 447 samples we looked at, about 12% had aconites. And not surprising, we found no aconites in May. Very few were found in June and July. Most of the aconites were, were, were typically common in uh, September. You know, decent number found in August, but mostly in September. And specifically in Lake Apacon, um, we do have genera that are known to produce, produce the aconites. We found no aconites in May or June, but then about a third of the samples in July, August, and September started to produce aconites. Um, so when we're looking at sampling for winter, early spring, um, this year we're actually looking into identifying and actually quantifying the number of aconites as per mills, like I showed in that previous slide for the uh, drinking water supply in northern New Jersey. Um, uh, we're also doing some incubation experiments, and I'll show you some, some examples of that, where we're actually going to look at um, sediment and water samples and, and uh, from deep versus shallow coves to see where these, um, where these HABs are coming from. Are they coming from specific areas of the lake? And then using this uh, on top of the existing hydrologic conditions relative to the to the season, we're hoping to get a to develop a more proactive strategy in both managing and controlling HABs earlier in the season. And I really can't take credit for this. I saw a lot of this at the North American Lake Management Society conference last year at Erie, uh, Pennsylvania. Army Corps has been doing a lot of this overwintering and this bench incubation study work. So we took a lot of their methodology and, and um, slightly modified it for our purposes. So um, we uh, this year we actually did, we, we purchased an incubator. We started with samples. Our first project, it was Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia. And this is data hot off the press. We 
the, the, the samples were incubated for uh, 14 days. They, the, the experiment was uh, ended in February, and I'm going to show you some of the results that we had from this study. So our, and again, very preliminary findings. And so we were using two supplemental pigments to quantify the cyanobacteria. So the one everyone we've been talking about, phycocyanin, which a very common pigment, um, uh, very, very common in, in planktonic forms of cyanobacteria. There's also one called phycoerythrin, which is more of a reddish pigment, and it tends to be more common in benthic forms of cyanobacteria. So this is something we're interested in looking in. You know, can we see a difference between phycocyanin and phycoerythrin? And can we use the phycoerythrin to distinguish benthic forms? And what we, after we did this experiment, which was re really interesting is we found that the samples that had a lot of sand, and those were samples from beach areas. Um, after 14 days of incubation, we had little to no cyanobacterial growth. However, in contrast, the sites that had a lot of silty organic sediment, we had measurable amounts of cyanobacterial growth. So, and that's not surprising, the silty, more organic material tends to have more nutrients associated with it as opposed to the sand. So uh, this may be providing some guidance in terms of how to manage these um, HABs early on, that you know the HABs may be starting in the silty, more organic sections of the lake. Um, and what was interesting is, as well as the samples we collected at the lake um, in early March, they were dominated by Amphanazomenon, but at the end of the incubation experiments, um, we had microcystis and cylindrospermopsis. And then where we had elevated phycoerythrin, we had elevated oscillatoria. And oscillatoria is a really well-documented benthic cyanobacteria. So we're hoping to use this other pigment to help distinguish between the planktonic and the benthic forms of cyanobacteria. Um, so in addition to identifying the locations of where the HABs may be originating, we're looking, and again, uh, you know, Army Corps has been ahead of this. You know, they're already looking at conducting specific treatments possibly earlier in the year, and then we're considering treatments possibly immediately over the sediments. But obviously we have to have discussions with DEP about uh, any sort of special permit or any sort of uh, special authorization to do any of these innovative strategies. But then there are others beyond the algicides, looking at the nutrient inactivation or the sinking technologies, oxygenation and the nanobubble systems, biological control techniques. And then if you do have some silty organic material favoring plant growth as opposed to HABs and possibly selective dredging. And I'm gonna wrap up here to show that, you know, when you have a stratified lake, when you have mixing, you can have a negative impact on those planktonic forms of cyanobacteria where you're, you're distributing them through the water column. But that same mixing event can actually introduce some more of those benthic colonies up into the water column. So a mixing event can have both a positive and a negative impact on these cyanobacteria. And the last thing I, I do want to emphasize when, when we go through a lot of this, a lot of these papers and, and research, while the presence of aconites and vegetated cells, they, they definitely can dictate where and when HABs may develop. And a lot of that is predicated on weather. They do not dictate the magnitude of the bloom. And that's something I've seen in a number of papers that they say, you know, the presence of the overwintering algae will help guide where the HABs may originate, but it doesn't, there's no direct relationship between that and the magnitude of the bloom. The nutrients, once the HABs are in the water column or growing along the bottom, it's nutrients that really drives the magnitude of the HABs. <clears throat> and again, I want to emphasize, and it's been mentioned here a couple times, you know, phosphorus is really what drives the growth of both algae and cyanobacteria. So you'll get more cyanobacteria. But again, a lot of recent studies have shown dissolved forms of nitrogen, nitrate, ammonia, uh, erythra, uh, um, a lot of those dissolved forms of nitrogen help to trigger HABs to produce cyanotoxins. So again, this is we use this information to really push not only watershed-based technologies to reduce nutrient loading, but the green infrastructure and septic management, because those strategies will take care of not only phosphorus, but also those, those dissolved forms of nitrogen. Uh, and then I just want to thank our team. These, these are the people who do the cell counts, who do a lot of the sampling, and I got to hand it to them. They, they really make my job a lot easier. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks, Fred. And we've
got a few minutes if folks have questions. Oh man, you just explained it all. <laughs> Great. All right. I, going. Not, I'm, I'm not sharing anymore, right? Correct. Oh, okay. there we go. Doug. Shoot. Yeah, I, I had a question um, when you were talking about the micro bubblers and some other techniques when you mix the water column. Is there any general thinking about how deep a water column is? Too deep for that to to cause issues like when you when you don't want mixing to occur. So it really depends on what you're using the mixing for. Uh, and again, Bob is on this on this session. He can definitely uh, weigh in on this. But essentially, if the goal is to keep the entire water column mixed to minimize internal phosphorus loading, to make sure that the bottom waters are oxygenated, you know, that's called a D-strat system. That's for the entire system, as opposed to many of the systems that would be focusing on a um, near shore beach area. Very frequently, we've had success with air curtains, but the only thing an air curtain is doing is just creating like this bubble curtain. And then all it does is it prevents cells from accumulating along the beach. So while the D-strat system takes care of a, a source of phosphorus coming from the sediments, internal phosphorus loading, an air curtain or many of the nano bubble technologies are really designed just to prevent an, an accumulation of cells along um, along the shoreline. And then there are other techniques like hypolimnetic aeration and oxygenation. It really depends on what you're trying to achieve in your lake and pond. And but to answer your question, if if you have a shallow lake, you may you more than likely are not interested in a full circ, uh, a full vertical vertical mixing. It depends on if you have a depletion of dissolved oxygen. That's usually happening when your deeper zone is like at least eight to 10 feet or deeper. That's when you can have that anoxic zone developing. Uh, yeah, OK, I, I was thinking of a body of water that has about a 30 foot depth in the middle. OK, and so in that case, you may have a large internal load. But that's why it's really key to know what your internal phosphorus load is versus what's coming in from the watershed. So if the watershed accounts for like 80 to 90 percent of your phosphorus, you want to focus on the watershed. But if your internal load is like 30 to 40 percent, um, and in the case of Lake Apacon, even though on an annual basis, the internal load is only 10 percent, we found that during the summer season, the internal phosphorus load can be up to 70 percent. So you really have to have that study to know where those sources of phosphorus are coming from to decide whether or not, you know, oxygenation or destratification is right for you. Thank you. Okay. All right, and Chris. Hey, Fred, I just had a, a question about the FICO erythrin measurements mm -hmm. that you're making. Um, is that with a sensor that you're it using? It is. It's actually. It's it's Turner Design, so it's the same company that makes the pens. Now I don't know if they make a pen for that one. We got a dual a dual monitor, so we have a meter that's measuring both FICO cyanin and FICO erythrin at the same time. So we just that that's that's the meter we purchased. It is more expensive. Um, they may have a pen for this, but um, we like we we just purchased it this year and we've been using it for some of our overwintering stuff and it's been working out nicely. I only ask because, uh, you know, with our with our continuous monitoring buoys, we have the option of phycocyanin or phycoerythrin, but we can't do both at the same time. Well, okay. we could do both if we bought both sensors, but the sensor doesn't measure both at the same time. Right. Yeah, and I guess if you had a shallower water body, I and the, and that 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 buoy was in a shallow area, I could definitely see be interested in that. But if you're in a really deep zone, you're probably not as much concerned about that as you are the planktonic forms. Okay. All right. Thanks. All yeah. right. Thanks so much. Um, next up, we have Dr. Nima Palavan with the Science Systems and Applications Incorporated at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Sensor, Center who's going to talk to us a little bit about some satellite-based analysis tools. And I can see your slides. They aren't in. Yep, there you go. Can I hear you? 
Uh, let me try. Excellent, excellent. I oh, can hear okay. you. You can. Okay, good. I can, and I saw your let slides, me... but you just took them down. Yeah, let me go back and reshare. Can you see my slide now, or? No, but I saw them just before. Yeah, okay, let me. Let me go back and reshare Windows. There you go. And, and let me go to the full screen go. mode, presenter, pointer, laser pointer. All right. Oh, thank you very much, Elsie, uh, for the introduction and for the invitation. Really appreciate it. I'm very thrilled uh, to be able to talk to you about the, the work that we have been doing uh, for the past couple of years. Um, my name is Nima Pahlavan. I'm leading the freshwater sensing program, uh, Science Systems and Applications Inc. or SSAI. It's a um, SSI is a government contracting company, uh, primarily serving uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and then that's uh, where I have an office. Um, I've had an office for the past ten years. Uh, Stream, which stands for a satellite-based analysis tool for uh, rapid evaluation of aquatic environments, um, have been. Uh, have been under development for the past six, seven years. Uh, it's of course a big, big team behind this effort uh, from um, civil servants at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center to uh, all my team members who have been doing uh, different pieces and components of uh, this, this activity. Uh, so just to give you a sense of, uh, of what we are doing, uh, our mission is to, uh, to provide consistent, reliable and advanced global water relevant uh, aquatic science products from satellite observations. Our vision in doing so is to support sustainable use of aquatic ecosystems and their services for imp improved livelihood of all. Uh, if you're wondering about what we do uh, on a day to day basis, uh, we develop um, satellite products, we uh, um, formulate and implement um, um, algorithms, uh, primarily machine learning based algorithms. We validate them and we interact with uh, various stakeholder, stakeholders across the country or across the globe to, to, uh, to, to get them essentially help us verify the, the quality and uh, the accuracy of those uh, products. So Stream uh, started in 2017. Uh, back then, uh, we had a, a workshop organized at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, a water quality workshop uh, where we had uh, more than 150 individuals present uh, in Greenbelt, Maryland, uh, where the workshop happened. And we essentially uh, entertained the idea of having uh, high resolution satellite observations uh, for for the use of water quality monitoring. Uh, the idea and the concept was well received back then, um, and uh, there was a lot of excitement around this, this um, monitoring tool. And the whole idea and the concept is, it was nothing new at the time because the Cyan project was being uh, already developed, but the, the prime uh, idea behind this um, tool was that uh, Landsat and Sentinel-2 data, which, which has a special resolution, have special resolutions of 10 to 30 meter resolution had just been um, available uh, at, at high uh, frequency and that would allow us to essentially think about uh, developing a system based upon those observations. So the idea of course um, was to augment field based water quality monitoring activity uh, via the satellite observations and products and uh, to focus only on areas which are uh, aquatic ecosystems which are wider than 100 meters or so. I just mentioned 10 to 30 meter special resolution, but there are uh, mother, nature, mother nature limitations uh, corresponding to the utility of a particular observation at 10, at 10 or 30 meter resolution. So that's why on the conservative, conservative side, we, um, we've been talking about the system to provide uh, good quality observations and products at 100 meter resolution and, and beyond. Um, so towards the end of 2017 and early 2018, NASA headquarters, uh, Earth Observations for uh, Sustainable Development Goal Office, uh, approached us and sort of uh, provided essentially um, support 
for for the development of this system um, and uh, because of the EO for SDG or a sustainable development goal nature of the system, we uh, started interacting with uh, a global the global community water authority of different authorities of different uh, countries uh, and tell them about uh, this uh, this particular system that would uh, hopefully streamline uh, uh, consistent reporting of sustainable de development goal six uh, SDG 632 in particular relevant to water quality and um, from there we essentially started uh, also reaching out to various stakeholder stakeholders across the country um, so stream uh, covers a wide range of applications um, from accidental discharges to illegal uh, mining activities that would lead to water pollution to uh, ecosystem monitoring ap applications relevant to harmful algal blooms, um, uh, areas covered uh, in uh, and for 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 recreational purposes, uh, for public health matter, and uh, supporting um, issuing advisory and, uh, and beach closure in, in different parts of the country and the globe. Uh, to dam operations, um, areas um, impacted by sedimentation and potentially pollution could be essentially identified. Uh, using stream uh, products. Drinking water supplies can be monitored when we're hoping to be able to pinpoint uh, areas of concern and time to start and stop um, the treatment of the water. Uh, uh, hypoxia is another application that we're targeting. Uh, we, we definitely have uh, products that could support identifying and uh, delineating those um, impacted areas. Uh, shellfish and aquaculture industry is another area that we have been uh, interacting with over the past six months or so. There are, of course, uh, major restoration projects across the country in Chesapeake Bay, for instance, uh, where uh, shellfish and aquaculture uh, industry are, are, are significantly booming and we are hoping that our system would, would enable uh, a better a better quantification of improvements in the uh, in the um, ecosystem restoration activities all right let's see yeah so the the functionalities and vision for a stream includes a near real-time image processing with a latency of three to six hours essentially the images are downloaded as soon as they're downloaded uh three to six hours after they are observed and they're measured um, they get processed in an hour or two and then they will be provided on the web interface which is shown shown here uh, to the to the right uh, the missions uh, uh, include Landsat and Sentinel-2 uh, with that special resolution that I've already indicated. The products that we're uh, planning to um, release would include Chlorophyll A, Total Suspended Solids, and, and Seki Disk uh, um, Depth. Um, the images and the maps will be available for download in GeoTIFF format. Uh, the system will allow some uh, basic visualization capabilities uh, that includes time series and ass assessments, uh, daily, weekly, or monthly. Uh, that could be applicable to uh, per pixel queries or um, area based uh, queries as, as, as needed by users. We're hoping to include an alert system uh, where end user will uh, receive a notification of um, about an area of concern. And over the past uh, uh, two years or so, in the, in the 2021 2022 timeframe, we had uh, several beta end users that uh, essentially got their hands on the system and provided some, um, some feedback to us. Uh, Peru and Uruguay water authorities were, uh, were some of those, and we really appreciate their, uh, their feedback over time. So just to give you a sense of uh, the kind of a use case, uh, uh, use cases that we have uh, developed over past the year or so after the initial uh, feedback from our beta end users. Um, uh, we work with a couple of um, scientists who work with uh, aquaculture farmers uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. Here are some of the maps that we initially shared with them. These are generated from Sentinel-2 data. Again, 10 to uh, 30 meter resolution. In this case, 20 meter resolution for, for Sentinel-2. And shown are Chlorophyll-A, um, Seki, and TSS maps. 
And um, as you can see, uh, the chlorophyllase is indicating a high special variability for this particular uh, case. The, uh, the particular farm is actually shown here and in a red box. And then there's also SECI and TSS, which are showing less special variability for this, in this, for this particular observation uh, on September 7th, 2021. So when we share these uh, maps with our uh, partners in the Chesapeake Bay, they were so excited. And the first question, they had was uh, can you do the do this in time and of course we mentioned that that's one of the goals of a stream and that's uh, something that will be provided as part of um, a stream uh, tool um, so outside of the stream for for the matter of demonstration we essentially processed the entire record of Landsat and Sentinel 2 starting from 2016 in these cases and asked them to also share their um, uh, water quality measurements uh, for that particular for that particular form and here is um, here are the chlorophyll a TSS and and Seki um, time series data and as you can see there is a small overlap between uh, in-situ water quality measurements uh, and shown in the blue uh, in 2018 ish time frame and the red curves which are indicative of sentinel 2 derived uh, water quality are showing a good match and a good capture of uh, the, the temporal variability. Um, the, we also have the TSS data from uh, from in situ observation. There's also good overlap uh, and good consistency across the board for that um, time frame. And there's also there's, of course, no data from for the SECI. But as you can see, the said land side is sort of filling the gap in the uh, 2015 2018 time frame, uh, in addition to Sentinel 2. Here is another example, uh, another farm uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, a slightly less eutrophic conditions in the in the lower part of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, lower chlorophyll A values. But as you can see, there's still good, uh, decent uh, correlation and correspondence between uh, in situ uh, chlorophyll A data and Sentinel-2 derived chlorophyll A data. Similar story uh, the, for TSS um, and less frequent uh, Landsat derived uh, TSS in this case. Um, one thing to note that for chlorophyll A retrievals, we only rely on Sentinel-2 data. Uh, Landsat-8 doesn't have the spectral capability required to retrieve chlorophyll A. So that's why you see Landsat data only shown for uh, derived products are only shown for TSS and SECI. Here is another example in our uh, in a collaboration and partnership with uh, Massachusetts Water, Water, Water Resource Authorities uh, over Wachusett uh, Reservoir. Um, chlorophyll A, TSS, uh, and SECI are similarly shown. And uh, what, what I want to highlight here is that we're capturing our algorithm, essentially capturing a wide range of uh, variability from 0.1 milligram per cubic meter uh, to to about 100 milligram per cubic meter of chlorophyll A. Uh, TSS is showing less variability with some episodic uh, variability and changes in, in early 2021 for this uh, section or this location of the uh, Wachusett Reservoir. Uh, this is Quabian Reservoir, uh, MWRA uh, requested us to look at uh, this uh, reservoir as well. Again, uh, a significant dynamic range is captured with chlorophyll A and, and, and uh, as well as TSS. Uh, and the, for these two particular reservoirs, we haven't had, um, haven't got our hands on in-situ measurements. So that's why you don't see any in-situ uh, uh, measurements uh, uh, Overlaid. Uh, here's Boston Harbor again in our work with MWRA with a with a very good um, coverage and, and and from the in situ uh, measurements, all the cruises that they have had over the years. And as you can see, there is still good correspondence between our uh, derived water quality products, uh, chlorophyll and TSS. Uh, Land Sentinel two in particular seems to be very quite quite consistent with um, uh, in situ measurements for TSS and SECI. Uh, we do see some anomalies uh, shown uh, by Landsat 8, and uh, these are things that we're currently looking at to make sure that um, our products uh, would be provided by uncertainties. And if uncertainties are high, we of course recommend end users not to use uh, those um, uh, derived uh, uh, products. So stream 1.0 will be live in a few weeks. Uh, um, 
this will be a phase release. Uh, so the, the products will be uh, out at a demonstration level uh, in, um, within the next few weeks, April or May. And the uh, visualization and download capabilities will be um, allowed through our system. The geographic scope uh, is currently planned to be CONUS uh, and in the 2023 timeframe, as well as we're, hope, we're hoping to be able to enable the forward near real time data processing, meaning that in the next summer uh, we should have some some maps uh, from uh, from a stream. Uh, of course, we're going to be focusing on a couple of other countries um, uh, to, for the provision of uh, water quality products. And at this point, we're also looking to expand our partnership with early adopters to to further demonstrate the utility and um, uh, efficacy of this uh, system. Uh, stream top. 2.0 is being planned already. Uh, our web inf interface will be enhanced significantly. Those time series analyses will be made available, and that the plan is currently uh, for the end of um, summer uh, fall time frame for a stream 2.0. We will continue to have develop algorithm and, and validate them um, and be able to uh, fully uh, process uh, CONUS data uh, in, in 2024. Uh, the goal is to essentially do global production um, starting from CONUS and a few other countries. Uh, we have been asked to provide uh, skin or surface temperature and that's it's readily available from Landsat and we're hoping to be able to add uh, temperature data, data as well. Um, the one important aspect of uh, the system is that it's uh, scalable and it could be expanded to other satellite missions uh, currently uh, managed and operated by NASA, uh, USGS or um, European Space Agency's uh, Copernicus. Currently, we're just focusing on Landsat 8 and 9 and Sentinel 2 A and B, but Sentinel 3 data, all chi data can be uh, included as well. And we're also planning to include um, uh, recently launched uh, NASA's PACE mission in this in the processing as well. Uh, so one question might be in your mind on your mind, uh, and that would be how does this compare to uh, to Cyan? Uh, so Cyan is based on Sentinel-3 OLCI or OCI. Um, it has 300 meter resolution uh, uh, versus the 10 to 30 meter special resolution of Landsat and Sentinel-2. Um, one important thing here is the uh, the algorithm. We're using a machine learning model uh, which uh, produces uncertainties as well uh, versus uh, the algorithm that it's built into Cyan, which is a line height uh, approach. Um, the input to our machine learning model is uh, atmospherically corrected um, um, uh, radiances or reflectances, which we refer to as remote sensing reflectance, versus cyan is using a uh, really corrected reflectance or spectra as input to this line height approach. So it's not a full blown atmospheric correction. We're producing three different products, chlorophyll ATSS and SECI, and uh, cyan is, is outputting uh, cell counts or chlorophyll A in a, in a categor categorical manner. Um, so if you would like to be part of uh, Stream Early Adopter, please uh, scan this uh, QR code and we'd be happy to um, provide you further updates about the stream. Uh, if you have any particular lake or reservoirs of interest, uh, we will be happy to add that particular region. Um, in our data processing uh, system, uh, uh, even at the demonstration level. And uh, I also appreciate NASA and USGS for their support of uh, uh, this, this particular system. With that, I'll end and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nima. That was some fascinating work. I'm sure some folks have questions for you. We have a couple minutes for questions. Sure. People are always shy to raise their hand. Takes a good 10 seconds. <laughs> so I'm just curious because I, I noticed um, so the, the the cyan would give you cell counts. Um, you're not doing cell counts, or, but are you setting up basically chlorophyll A uh, to estimate the cell counts? 
So um, for us, uh, we're outputting chlorophyll A in milligram per cubic meter, um, typical units, and TSS in gram per cubic meter and uh, seki in, in meters. Um, um, the the cyan project is, is providing cell counts, which is uh, uh, which can be readily scaled to chlorophyll A in milligram per cubic meter. So it's it's basically chlorophyll A from cyan is comparable to uh, what uh, stream will produce. Okay. Thank you. Robert. I think you're muted, Robert. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. OK, um, we're on a little little lake in northern New Jersey called Cupsaw Lake. And we're entering into a cooperative initiative with uh, NJIT to uh, try to reduce the amount of phosphorus entering the lake from our uh, septic systems. Uh, we study the lake and collect data, and I was wondering if this NASA program would consider uh, providing data to a small 65 acre lake. Uh, in the mountains of uh, New Jersey. Absolutely, I don't see why, uh, why not. Um, so um, for that matter, we're going to process um, uh, Sentinel-2 and Landsat data over that particular lake you just mentioned, and you can send the share the name of the, uh, the, the, the system um, on chat. Uh, but with that particular scene or a tile being processed, it will of course cover uh, about 100 or 185 kilometer of area. So other lakes and uh, regions uh, will also be covered, whether it be rivers or uh, wider streams. Um, sure, uh, to answer your question, absolutely. Great, thank you. And then Sasha, you can ask your question. Um, well, I was just wondering, and again, apologies if this was already answered, um, if there were any size limitations like with the satellite images. Um, there is, um, and that's a great question. So um, the Sentinel-2 offering uh, a 10 meter, 20 meter, and 60 meter, meter resolution, depending on the spectral bands. Um, and Landsat is fixed at 30 meter uh, for all the uh, spectral bands. Um, but because of the uh, um, something called adjacency effect, which is the a photon reflected off the nearby targets and objects uh, around a particular water pixel. Um, essentially, retrievals of water quality um, parameters uh, will not be as accurate because you're dealing with an adjacent signal that it's it doesn't represent water. For that matter, uh, we're not going to promise 10 to 30 meter resolution per se uh, as sort of our special resolution. Rather, um, uh, we're going after about uh, two by two, or three by three, or five by five areas, meaning. Areas larger than um, 100 meters or so would should be uh, observable without much contamination from adjacent uh, photons uh, from nearby targets. So just a quick follow up. So smaller than 100, um, it could be observed. Just yes. I promise it'll be perfect. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And next up, we have Katrina McCarthy, who is the director of NJ Map at Rowan University, and she's going to be giving us an overview of the NJ Map. And I think she's going to be just kind of doing a tutorial. So, Katrina. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I do not see the take control button. Oh, wait, share. Am I using the share option? Yep, you can use the share button awesome. next to the leave button. All right, so I am just gonna kind of say up front, I am a little bit out of my depth here. I am so blown away by the incredible resources and knowledge shared here today. So just wanna thank um, Chelsea and Katie for the invitation. 
Um, and I wanted to just kind of give a little bit of a brief overview of some really kind of innovative things that we've been trying to do at the GeoLab. Um, so my name is Katrina McCarthy. I am going to keep my camera off because otherwise I'm going to be looking in eight different directions. Um, but if for some reason you can't hear me or my slides aren't advanced and just feel free to let me know. Um, so thank you for having me here today. I will be sharing two resources that we make freely available through our research lab, which are NJ Map and the Conservation Blueprint, both of which have been developed through years of cobbling together grant funding by the GeoLab. The GeoLab really got its start because there was such a wealth of data and information that is produced by authoritative data sources in New Jersey. And around 2011, we recognized that New Jersey, with its unique landscapes and its rich environmental history, has a number of data sets that New Jersey taxpayers helped to create. And we wanted to bring to life these data sets in easy to understand ways so that everyday people, not just GIS professionals or scientists or engineers or planners, like just everyone in general, could understand environmental impacts and the conditions in their area. So the land use land cover data set that is developed by DEP um, is especially central to the work that we do. What was the biggest game changer was animating the land use patterns, as you saw in the GIF on the last slide, and being able to see graphically the magnitude of change that has occurred in our neighborhoods over time. It's proven to be an impactful and powerful way to communicate environmental changes and understanding other planning dimensions in New Jersey. So with this as a jumping off point, we've developed a number of themes which you can kind of see like a little bit of a map gallery here of some of the themes or products that we've developed. Katrina, if you are sharing, we can't see anything. I thought we were you were just given an overview of everything up front, but um, if you are sharing oh. your screen, we can't see it. Yeah, I am. That's weird because it says share content window. Hmm. Can you see anything now? Nope. Hmm. Yeah, bummer. Um, what can I do? I mean, I did send you my slides, but that's going to not allow yeah. me to do a live demo, which is going to stink. I wonder if I just try sharing the entire screen instead of the window. Anything? No. No. Let me see. I mean, I can pull up. I can leave and I know that that's not ideal, but I mean, I can leave and come back. Um, Do you want me to pull up your your slides and we can at least go through that sure. piece? Yeah. Okay. Why not? I'm All sorry, right. Chelsea. No, 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 don't don't sweat it. You are not the first to have issues today. Not sure what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> We're making it a bit of a pattern. So hang on one second and I'll bring them up. Thank you. Awesome. So you can go ahead and advance. OK, so these are the two tools next. OK, sorry, so this is um, kind of what I was talking about with animating um, land use impacts, and this is just our urban growth map where you can. Um, and if I had the ability to live demo, but I did link in the chat, um, you can go to our urban growth theme and you can zoom into any area in the state. You can turn on parcels, you can change your background map. So here we have the 1930s aerial imagery, um, and then you're seeing kind of just the development. You can advance, Chelsea, please. OK, and then this is our map gallery that's just trying to kind of showcase some of the use cases that we have, um, you know, taken the DEP's land use land cover data and really tried to drill down into a bunch of diver derivative um, versions. So looking at what does forest fragmentation look like over time, um, impervious surface increases by watershed, 
Um, and then you can look at agricultural loss. We also have um, an animated map on there of um, the success of farmland preservation. Um, so all of these I can link in the chat and we can advance and I could just keep kind of moving along. And then the second um, thing that I really wanted to highlight was just the efforts of the conservation blueprint. Um, so Rowan is part of a kind of three group, um, three entities that have been shepherding this effort since 2015. And what it's really trying to do is get everyone um, in the same room to, to come up with a collaborative vision for our future land system in New Jersey. And so around 2015, it was a common phenomenon that, you know, many people were working on land preservation in this corner, but they didn't know other people might be also targeting that, or there was a really great um, piece of land for sale that no one really knew, you know, was in their area. So trying to get all of the entities together um, and then with harnessing the power of getting everyone together, um, taking you know the direction of those subject matter experts and getting the best available authoritative data to develop models to um, come up with priorities. And you can advance to the next slide, please. For um, so basically, not just creating another web map, but getting everyone in the room that is involved in land management and land conservation preservation in New Jersey to talk to one another about stewardship management, um, red tape, how to come up with green tape initiatives for just accelerating and um, increasing the pace of both preservation, but also just better stewardship in general. Um, and you can advance the next slide. And so these are the models that I said we um, we pride ourselves um, on basically taking the best available authoritative data, pairing that with the collaborative input from scientific or subject matter experts to create um, models. So for the blueprint, we have um, these five, technically six priority models because what we found is, you know, people come at land conservation and preservation from these different angles. And so there's not like a one size fits all priority model, um, but you can explore the different models for each of these and you can advance, Chelsea. This is also in the chat. Um, and this is just a quick infographic of how we've worked successfully over the last 10 years. We take a lot of technical products and we pair it with collaborative input from experienced professionals and we take an iterative approach to developing tools and platforms so that we can make it digestible hopefully fingers crossed to the public and so that it's you can easily kind of disseminate information that's often kind of locked away in data viewers and um, things of that nature and you can advance please um, and this is just a shout out to our team. So we are only two, full, we were one, one full-time person. We are officially now two full-time people. Um, and then some really talented and passionate part-time employees, uh, grad students and student interns. And John Hassey is our uh, principal investigator, and professor at Rowan University. You can advance. And then the other thing, um, since I'm not going to be able to demo, what I really wanted to say is that we host the NJMAT platform, and hopefully some of you are playing with um, the tool because I put the links in the chat. Um, we host it on Amazon Web Services, and we, we take pride in, in hopefully developing tools that can be used in the field. You can turn on New Jersey's 3.1 million you know, tax parcels at any given moment, and they should load quickly, and you can quickly query um, that information. And if you right-click at any spot on the map, you will see a little menu that provides a data bridge to other resources that are out there that could be impactful to your work. So just recognizing, you know, we can't be the experts on everything. So we try to right click to, as you can see, all these resources here, Flood Mapper, GeoWeb, Lucy, Change, Environmental Justice Map, and it will take you to that map in the same Zoom, the same location so that you don't have to, you know, try to figure out what Zoom level you were at or the exact location, it should just automatically connect you in the same spot. And you can advance, please, Chelsea. 
Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is if you have your the parcels turned on in any of our conservation blueprint or NJ map um, pages, once the parcels are on, you can right click from that map menu that I just showed you in the last slide and you can open up parcel explorer and what it will give you is a ton of metrics and information for that given parcel so if you want things as simple as measurements or planning information we've sliced and diced a ton of metrics in here so that on the planning level on the municipal level um, you know, New Jersey being the home rule state, and this is where the decisions are made. It's just we found critically important to have this information for every parcel. Um, so that is, you know, a huge resource. You can also just directly um, navigate to this site. You don't have to link through the tool. It's just if you look up, you know, NJ Map Parcel Explorer, you can just go straight there and you can search for the location that you are looking for. There's a number of different ways to search and you can advance. I'm almost, yep, you can advance through this as well. Cool. And then so I was just going to do a little bit of a demo, which is a bummer, but um, yeah, uh, our research lab is engaged right now in the state plan and we are excited to be the mapping consultant for the Office of Planning Advocacy as they are um, forging ahead with a state plan update. And if you're not aware of this effort, I encourage you to check it out. I'll also put that in the chat as well. And some of the maps that we are developing. Um, so, for example, this one on the screen, you can see the land resource impacts that are turned on right now. Those are, you know, if you tallied up all of the land that has been developed since we've been collecting data on it, it's about 366,000 acres. And that has become urbanized um, since we've started keeping track. And all of that, those have been lost resources, whether it's agriculture, forest or wetlands that have been lost to development or some type of development. So this is kind of a quick glimpse where you can see, you know, all of the forest loss in Ocean County and the ag kind of belt along the 95 corridor. Um, and I can share some of these other links out as well. And I, you can advance Chelsea. And that is all I had. Thank you so much for bearing with me and apologies for not being able to demo. Now that it's an incredible amount of information that went into those maps um, and I really hope that folks do make sure they go to those links and, and try it out. So if anybody has a question for Katrina. Can we have time for one or two questions? Okay, they're going to put question. I guess there's a question in the chat. In the meantime, I don't see any hands raised. Yeah, I can follow up in the chat. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and up next, we have Matt Cerami from Veolia as a watershed manager and Dr. Matt Titus, who is a managing member at Clearwater Analytica, and they're going to talk about AI forecasting for HEBS. So this one, we have planned to for me to pull up for them, so <laughs> hopefully there won't be any issues here. Let me just pull up the presentation. All right. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Chelsea. Appreciate it. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Cerami, Watershed Manager here at Veolia Haworth and I'm here today to talk about AI forecasting for harmful outcomes. First off, we'll start off with a little bit of more information about the Hackensack River watershed. It's a multi-reservoir system, starting with the headwaters of Lake DeForest in Rockland County, New York. Then we have Lake Tapan, Woodcliffe Lake, and Oradell Reservoirs here in Bergen County, New Jersey. Total watershed area is 72,000 acres with 4,000 acres owned and managed by Veolia in New Jersey and total raw water storage is 14 billion gallons. We manage this natural resource using our holistic watershed management strategy, which focuses on key areas such as data collection, processing and validation, aquatic and terrestrial uh, wildlife management, forestry management, ecological transformation and conservation and community engagement. 
Next slide, please. Just a little bit more about the team here. Uh, myself, Matt Ceramy, again, watershed manager, licensed operator, and aquatic pesticide applicator. We also have Tyler Arnold, aquatic biologist and data analytics, and Ron Farr, certified forest. So just a brief overview of the project. We'll identify the scope and goals, identify sources of data, define data architecture and automation, the development of a customized web-based dashboard, and we'll evaluate the project implementation and results. Next slide. So the risk of harmful algal blooms is a significant threat to surface water bodies across the globe. To prevent ecological and economic impacts, predicting these natural events is essential. The goals for the project are to build a customized web-based dashboard for HABs forecasting and to better use AI to manage source water. Looks like we lost the slides. And I got booted out of Teams. So apology, <laughs> apologies, no idea. Just shut down. Hang on one second. Let me reload for you. Get back to where we were. I, it is a day for patience. OK, you were here. Got it. Next, we'll take a look at some of the sources of data. First of all, we have uh, in situ quality from our vertical profiler, as well as discrete sampling, meteorological data, satellite imagery for cyanobacteria and chlorophyll A estimates, microbiological data and toxins, as well as stream discharge data. Next slide, please. We take all these sources of information and formed an automated uh, data pipeline. EOPS, which is our in-house SCADA historian, provides treatment plant intake and post-staff data, as well as lab data. Clearwater Analytica provides satellite imagery and global weather data. Our vertical profiler, again, uh, provides in situ water quality data. And SAMS, which is our lab data historian, provides uh, algal counts and toxin data. So all of this information is now collected hourly and pushed da daily to the models on a fully automated basis. Next slide. So the final result is a web-based uh, interactive dashboard that has historical and current satellite imagery, weekly and seasonal forecasts, and in-situ water quality data. So let's uh, take the time now to jump into the dashboard and see how it works.
All right, and with that, I'll turn it over to Matt Titus of Clearwater Analytica to uh, go into a little bit more detail about what's going on behind the scenes with the models. All right, thanks. Chelsea, could you? Great. Um, Matt, was there anything that you wanted to discuss on this slide in particular? No, I was no. going to let oh. you take it from here. Oh, yep. this, great, thanks. This um, this is an example of the utility of this Cyan uh, product that actually Robert gave a great introduction to just a little while ago. So we've got these three dates from this last, uh, uh, not last season, but the season before when we first gotten the dashboard deployed, where you can see the bloom that's arisen on the 28th and Matt's able on the ground to track that showing up in the reservoir and then it declining in early July. So it's just nice to see that data validated with on the ground measurements. Um, this is something that Robert kind of underlined. You can't always trust the Cyan data product to be 100% accurate when it's on these coastal uh, grids, but um, it, we've seen that this data has been validated pretty well in practice. The higher resolution image on the left is chlorophyll estimates. So we take remote sensing data and we get an index of, of a rough chlorophyll concentration that's calibrated for the, this particular water body. And so that is coming from Sentinel-2 data, which has a much higher resolution than the Sentinel-3 product that you see in those images on the right. <clears throat> Could you go to the next slide, Chelsea? Thanks. So. Um, from you know the 10,000 foot view, the HAB risk um, quantity that we that we produce is a forecast for the next seven days of what the maximum cell count detected will be, and the approach that we take there is what we call a Bayesian model average. This is based off of a paper by Hamilton, which is a group out of Australia, um, back in 2009. And so the idea here is, um, as the George Box quote indicates, we, we have this suite of models. There are many, many models that each might inform us in one way or another. They might be based on nutrients. We might have another based on weather and remote sensing data. And so we take all of these different estimates and we take uh, their average in a, in a principled manner, basically giving a greater voice to the models that we have the most trust in. So that forms our Bayesian model average. There are a number of different models that go, machine learning approaches that go into this. I'm a big fan of um, gradient boosted models. Uh, and we've seen good results from this. Could we go to the next slide, please? Um, kind of on the other end of things, in, for the BMA, the data that goes into it involves Matt, all the, all the things that Matt Cerami is collecting uh, in situ and stream gauges. This secondary risk product is a nationwide risk product that's based on that Cyan product. Um, so you take Cyan's estimates of cell counts and local weather data, and you use those to get a an estimate of over the next seven days what we think Cyan will detect for the cell count estimates. And so this has been um, Again, it's available across the entire continental US, and we've had good luck with this as well. I believe that the EPA has recently published, they're doing something very similar that's just come out last month. Um, next slide, please, Chelsea. And then finally, just to go back to the blog that Matt brought up, um, part of our design philosophy is that we should, you, you want your data to be actionable. Uh, you want it to be interpretable to the watershed manager. And so the blogs kind of serve as a quick stop and off point. Um, you can jump in. We have these on the, the red donut. We have kind of a current state of affairs, what we think will happen over the next seven days based on the data available to us. Uh, the green donut on the left gives you a look back. Uh, what were our predictions previously? And so you can validate at, on the ground. Did we see this play out? Um, are these probabilities? well calibrated to the frequency that we're seeing bloom activity. And then below that, um, there are these seasonal indicators. So where are we in terms of HAP risk? How often at this point in the season have we seen blooms in this water body in the past? 
as well as uh, what's our cumulative precipitation um, or temperature at the lake. Are we in the middle of a dry season or is it is it wet and hot, et cetera. So this is just a place where you can go and quickly 60 seconds kind of get an idea of what's going on in your watershed. And I'm gonna pass it back to Matt. All right, excellent. Thank you, Matt. Now we'll take a look at how we uh, use artificial intelligence to better manage source water. Um, so it all starts with water quality at depth. Uh, these great heat maps that you see on screen are also generated by Clearwater Analytica on a fully automated basis. Um, on screen, we've got some key indicators for harmful algal bloom activity. We've got water temperature, dissolved oxygen, uh, blue-green algae, phycocyanin, and chlorophyll A. Um, so if you take a look uh, at the beginning of the growing season around mid to mid to late June, you can see the, the water column starts to become thermally stratified. And if you bounce over to the uh, BGAPC tab, you can see that's where we see our first significant increase in cyanobacteria uh, activity, right? Which also correlated to an increase of dissolved oxygen uh, at the top of the water column. So it was at this time around uh, actually, on June 20th, we um, decided to make our first algicide treatment, which you could see was uh, very effective by the decrease in BGAPC readings shortly after, um, as well as a reduction in uh, dissolved oxygen uh, at the top of the water column. So another thing that we noticed is that post-algicide treatment, we see on the Oradell here anyway, we see an increase in chlorophyll A uh, concentrations as those cells are sort of be, are being lysed. So you can see that as, as well on the far right hand side. Um, so moving forward uh, through the growing season, we get to mid July. Um, you can see the water columns really heating up there. Um, by my memory, it was around 27, 28 degrees C. And here's where things get really interesting. This is also um, the time of year where we have the highest degree of dissolved oxygen stratification which correlated directly with our most concentrated and most prolonged period of cyanobacteria growth, right? Um, so it was at this time that we decided to make our second algicide treatment for the season on July 24th, which you could see again, we saw a very rapid decline in BGAPC um, and then dissolved oxygen returned to pre-bloom conditions as well as that uh, release of chlorophyll A uh, shortly after the treatment. Um, so. Also, it's worth noting while I'm on this page that just shortly after that second treatment, we turned on our new reservoir aeration system, which the good folks at Princeton Hydro helped us install. So I believe with the, the well the well timed uh, algicide treatments and the the bringing that new system online, the water quality was uh, much more favorable the rest of the growing season. Next slide, please. So now we'll take a look at some of our uh, seasonal and weekly predictions. So. On screen here, you've got the predictions for the week of 719 to 725. Our bloom risk was 94.6%, which was 51% higher than the historical uh, average. So if you take a look at that chart on left, on the left, uh, you see the line in red is our historical prediction, and the blue line is where we trended throughout 2023. So significantly higher than the historical average. Um, the donut chart, as Matt Titus mentioned, is our you know week to week prediction. So again, you see that 94.6% on the on the blue donut. So right right in the middle of this time period is when we chose to make our second algicide treatment on July 24th. And if you move to the next slide, you can see the effects of that treatment. So here we've got some satellite images. Um, 7:22, we received a, a a satellite image greater than 100,000 cells per mil. Um, this one was around 225 cells per mil on the on the 22nd. So again, we made our second algicide treatment on the 24th, and then by the 31st of July, we received a non-detect image from the satellite, which is uh, below 6,000 cells per mil. So um, it's just validating that data, as Matt Titus mentioned, that you know what we're seeing from the models, what we're seeing on the on the satellites is is happening real time on the ground, and we've got confirmation that we've uh, you know had an effective algicide treatment. Next slide. So here we'll take a look at some of our algal counts uh, over the last three years. So this is 2021 to 2023. Um, again, we took over with these new management strategies in 2022. And what I find really interesting here is if you take a look at May and June, the beginning of the growing season, and you look at the year over year comparison, um, 
the algal densities are actually declining on a you know uh, reliable downward trend in those in those months. Even though we may have had a significant spike in in July in in cyanobacteria growth, it seems that the way that we're managing things now is condensing down the the effects of the growing season or the time period in in which we have to deal with the blooms. Next slide, please. So again, here we've got the, the same algal counts from the previous slide, but the chart on the right is what we're uh, extremely proud of here. This is cyanotoxin detections at our treatment plant intake here in Haworth. So again, we took over with this management strategy in uh, 2022, where from 21 to 22, we saw a 50% reduction of microcystins at the treatment plant intake. And then from 22 to 23, another 50% reduction. So we actually had zero microcystins detection at the treatment plant intake. Uh, in 2023, um, we got a slight anatoxin detection, but wasn't wasn't very much to worry about. <laughs> Next slide, please. So, sticking with the treatment in, uh, plant intake, um, trying to make the connection to the work that we do out in the watershed with treatment plant improvements, because the main goal is to not only protect the environment, but Make the best drinking water possible for our customers. So some other some other trends that we we picked up on here at the treatment plant intake are pH, ORP, and dissolved organic matter. And these things have played out um, over the last couple seasons. Um, this year or this past year rather, in 2023, pH remained extremely stable throughout the year. Um, we hit a little bit of a high period uh, in the beginning of the year, but mainly below eight. Uh, uh, for most of the growing season, which suggests uh, good control over cyanobacteria and algal densities. What I find really interesting about this chart here is if you take a look at the red line uh, on, the, on the left hand side, we've got the oxidation reduction potential. Um, we've, we've zeroed in on that parameter as being the biggest indicator of treatment plant performance and sort of you know how you know the overall shape of the of the of the lake, right? So what's interesting, if you recall, we had our highest um, degree of cyanobacteria growth in July, right? Which coincides with the lowest point in that slope on the oxidation reduction uh, potential, right? Um, but what's really interesting here is that it actually started to decline all the way back in April, right? So that's telling us where we, you know, we don't see the blooms until June or July, but the beginnings of that of that activity are already happening several months uh, ahead of that, right? Um, on, the, on the opposite side, we noticed after our algicide treatments, uh, series of algicide treatments anyway, uh, the oxidation reduction potential uh, came back up into favorable range, right? Um, the other thing that we've noticed over the last few years is that a decrease in dissolved organic matter for, for us here on the Oradell pre uh, precludes a a uh, bloom in cyanobacteria. So you can see every time we have an increase at the at the intake of BGAPC, we've got a decrease in those FDOM readings uh, shortly before it. So that's another indicator that we use to to uh, give us a heads up that something's heading our way. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to expand on that ORP trend uh, a little bit more because I think it's really important uh, for us here at the Ordell anyway. Um, so ORP decreased by 43% from April to May of last year. From May to June, the uh, algal densities increased by 623%. Um, again, we made our first algicide treatment in June, which temporarily knocked down the, uh, the algal growth, but it resurged by 200% in, in July. Um, after that second treatment, however, the ORP returned uh, or increased by 100, uh, 182%. And you can see that coincides with a decrease in, in alkyl densities, right? So it's another thing that we that we use pretty heavily to time when we're gonna do our treatments. Even if it looks like we've got a, a major increase in algal densities, if ORP is holding steady in, in a favorable range, we may elect to delay the treatment. Uh, so if you take a look at that chart on the right, I've got it broken down into sort of like the good, if, good fair, and, and poor ranges uh, uh, as far as, treatment plant performance, right? So anything below 200 millivolts uh, ORP, it's going to be, we're going to have a very difficult time here at the at the treatment plant. Um, and then that 200 to 350 range is, 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 is fair. And then anything above 350 to 500 is, is, the, best, is the best range. Next slide. 
So we also were able to pick up on some uh, treatment uh, process improvements. So the, the charts that you see on screen are sulfuric acid usage. So um, we use that to lower the pH of the in, incoming uh, water to the treatment plant. So obviously the better the algal densities are controlled, the, the, you know, the lower the pH range will be the less sulfuric acid we'll have to use. Uh, so the chart on top is the uh, difference from the five-year average in pounds per day usage. Um, so if you take a look in March, we were pretty significantly above the, the five-year average in pounds per day, but that was due mostly to a bloom of uh, diatom uh, genre nichia, um, which also very uh, troublesome to deal with in the treatment plant. Um, but again, if you fast forward uh, to the middle of the growing season after we made those two treatments, you could see in July, we were already below the five-year average. And then after the second treatment, we did not have to use the sulfuric acid uh, for the remainder of the year. So even though when it was on, we may have had to use more of it, the, the, the period of time that we had to have it online was significantly reduced. Again, um, that suggests that we're condensing down the, the effects of the, of the growing season over, over the years. Next slide, please. Here we take a look at uh, filter uh, runtime performance. So again, in March, unfortunately, our, our filter run times were well below the average, the five-year average. Again, that was due to the, uh, the bloom of Nichia. Uh, but again, as we fast forward through the rest of the growing season, after the two treatments, you can see the, uh, the filter run time significantly improved for the rest of the growing season. And actually, we were above the five-year average for five, five months out of the growing season. So um, I know I mentioned the, the, the Nichia bloom twice. Actually, this year, I'm happy to report we did not get the Nichia. Um, and I've got some theories behind that, but, but time will tell, right? Next slide. And then finally, we've got some recognitions for the project here. Uh, in 2023, we were the recipient of the AWWA Innovation Award and the uh, NJDEP Governor's Environmental Excellence Award. That's it for me. Thank you for the time, everyone. Thank you guys so much. Um, that's really awesome to see something in place that's working. Um, I'm sure folks have questions for you. Uh, Kyle? Hi. Um, I have just a question on so how you made it. I guess I had two questions. Was um, one, do you know how many like samples you felt necessary to you know run in there to build the model and then what did you what did how did you define a bloom like you know with your with your samples for what it's predicting um i i'll try to address that i i uh the the number of data points that we usually look for when modeling depending on what you're predicting and and what data you're using um, it can change and depending on the water body, but um, usually about five dozen, it gets you into some neck of the woods that's all right and things tend to plateau for specific models after about 150 data points. Um, at that point, uh, to be to be clear, there's this trade off between how much data you have available and how complex you can make your model. And since we don't have billions of um, data points like ChatGPT does, we stick to simpler models, typically random forests and neural networks um, that are limited in size. So for that body of models, about 150 data points makes us pretty happy. Um, and then uh, what was the what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Um, that was really what helpful. Thankful. What the other a bloom? Yeah, what constitutes a bloom? Matt, I think we set that at 100,000 cells. Yeah, so we, we've got our models set at anything over 100,000 cells. Thank you. That was, that was an amazing presentation. It was very cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Again, there's always a lag. In the chat. OK, um, Val, do you want to ask what algaecide was being used in the reservoir? So we've been using uh, EarthTech liquid copper sulfate um, over the last couple of years since I've been here and for quite some time before that. But actually, 
this year we plan to um, full scale test the uh, green green clean liquid uh, hydrogen peroxide product. Um, we actually did some bench scale testing on it uh, throughout 2023, and it performed very well um, as far as being uh, more selective with what it actually kills. So uh, as far as our bench scale goes, it basically performed as advertised, but it almost exclusively targeted cyanobacteria and left our zooplankton and left uh, the diatom genres. So uh, we're excited to get that out on the water and see how it performs in the lake this year. Okay, and then another one, how do you handle input data uncertainties as part of your modeling? Um, this is a really good question. Uh, I'd like to say that we have a Bayesian hierarchical modeling approach, but the truth is that we treat the data as being um, faithful, but then we add uh, uncertainty to each model's input or each model's output. And so you have these point estimates and we're averaging a number of them and each one has associated to it a sort of Gaussian blur um, to account for basically how accurate we think those models have been in the past. Thanks. Anybody else? Doesn't look like it. Okay, with that, I think we're going to take a quick five minute break, regroup here, and then at an awkward, uneven time of <laughs> two, what would we say, 255? How's that work? Good? 255. All right, we'll see everybody back here in a few minutes. Okay. All right. I, we have just one last section of our HAB Summit left for the rest of the day. We're going to talk a little bit about numbers. First up is Emily Mayer from the Bureau of Freshwater Biological Monitoring here to talk about phycocyanin uh, data correlations. So, Emily? Um, and, I, and I can share your slides if you can't have them up. Uh, yeah, could you share your slides, please? Sure. Great. Thank you all for uh, allowing me to present today. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about the last two years of phycocyanin data and kind of looking a little bit further into the correlations. Next slide. So in today's presentation, we'll briefly be looking at primarily phycocyanin, uh, fluorescence, and cell counts. Prior to 2018, there were different calibration procedures that were conducted on some of the equipment that was used to test these parameters. So to reduce the likelihood of skewness when looking at, into these results, I made the decision to only look at data sets from 2018 to 2023 for consistency purposes. Um, so again, like I mentioned earlier, we're only going to be looking at the last two years worth of data. Um, for those who are not familiar with phycocyanin, this is a pigment that's emitted from cyanobacteria, which helps us detect their presence. And fluorescence is another measurement of phycocyanin, just in a different unit of measurement. Um, it has been debated about which unit of measurement should be used when monitoring for HABs. Um, but hopefully we can kind of get a better picture of what that looks like from our data today. To clarify, the phycocyanin um, with the units of parts per billion um, is data that's coming from our aquaflor meter, um, which you can kind of see on the right hand side, a picture of what that looks like. Um, and in comparison to the phycocyanin results, um, which is coming from our fluorescence meter uh, made by Turner Designs, um, which reads in micrograms per liter. Um, and so the fluorescence measures the intensity of the uh, 
fluorescence emitted by phycocyanin, which provides a relative comparison um, versus the phycocyanin um, that's being measured in the lab, which quantifies the actual concentration of the phycocyanin in the sample, which is more of a direct measure to abundance or specific concentration. Uh, lastly, we'll be looking at cell counts, which is the overall cyanobacteria assemblage account. Um, and when our biologists go out in the field to collect water samples, our phycologists in the lab will identify the cyanobacteria down to genus and we'll count each individual cell to get a total. Next slide. So when starting this process of reviewing the data, there were some prior steps that were needed before beginning our analyses. First was tracking down all the information and pulling all of our information from our HAB database, lake monitoring database, and other areas. Next was to comb through all the data, identify if there were any obvious gaps, fill in any missing data, or to um, add any additional keynotes. For example, some of the HAB samples may be too numerous to count or unable to quantify what the cell counts could be, either because the cell counts were lacking in identifiable characteristics or they were too tiny, et cetera. So those areas needed to be accounted for prior to analysis. To analyze this data, I used the software program RStudio and chose to use this program as it has been used in predictive models and hope to incorporate this information with other publicly available packages through the program to further develop a New Jersey specific model. Linear regressions were also used as well. Next slide. We'll be looking at two correlations. So phycocyanin and cell counts and fluorescence and cell counts. Um, in the coming months, we hope to conduct more of a deep dive into looking at specific site-specific leaks data and briefly compare results from other equipment. Next slide. And so we wanted to reevaluate this 2022 graph with 2023's data added. However, there were some unknowns with the creation of this graph, and I was unable to track down exactly the location of this to confirm the questions I had. Um, therefore, I wanted to just entirely reevaluate this information utilizing the raw data of cell counts, um, fluorescence counts, um, to determine what approximate reading we should be looking at uh, during the season and when most HABs start to become problematic, which is around 20,000, aligning with our tiered alert system. Next slide. And so looking at the raw data of cell counts and uh, fluorescence readings, um, which to remind everyone is the measurement of intensity of fluorescence emitted by phycocyanin, um, so based on what we see in the 2022 graph in figure two, many of the cell counts and readings are low and are below the 10,000 range. So we do not start to see elevated counts until an estimated 17. Uh, in comparison to the 2023 graph, we start to see um, elevated readings around 8 to 10 micrograms per liter um, in order to get to that 20,000 threshold. So if we take the average of these two readings from each year, we get an approximate result of 13 to 14 micrograms per liter. Um, another way to evaluate this data would be to look at the number of watch events and the number of advisory events to see if the reading is like what we are seeing, seeing here in the raw data. Next slide. Um, and so here we, um, so here we have two graphs that show a comparative summary of phycocyanin in the lab and the cell counts. Uh, note that the blue line is a standard linear regression line. Um, and the dots without the color are the data points. 
And the red dots are a predictor model based on the data provided. And when I mean predictor, um, meaning that it's based on the information provided where the points should theoretically have landed. In both graphs, we see the cell counts increase and so do the outliers and quite a bit of overlapping in the left-hand corner of the graph. So we need to zoom in to this area to get a better idea of what's going on. Next slide. And so these are the same graphs as the last slide, but zoomed in more. So in both graphs, we see a strong correlation and linear relationship between the phycocyanin readings, again, the readings done in the lab, and the cell count abundance, which makes sense since the phycocyanin readings that are recorded in the lab are the actual concentration of phycocyanin in the sample, um, giving a direct measure of its abundance. Again, we start to see the pattern that once the cell counts start to increase around 800,000 cells per ml range, the number of outliers start to increase in the 2023 graph. The closer the red dots are to the black dots, the closer the relationship of variables being phycocyanin um, and cell counts in this case. And this model is to support the relationship of the variables to help identify the outliers. Next slide. So here's an example of evaluating the data on a more site specific level. In 2023, we don't see much of a clear pattern here as the points are kind of scattered about. Um, more analysis is needed to kind of get a better idea of the relationship going on going on as we have data going back to 2018 and 2019. But from what we can tell based on both graphs, I estimate that the readings we should be looking at and looking for is within the range of 13 to 20 for a watch alert. Um, 2022 shows more of a positive linear relationship versus 2023 is not as linear and not as clear as far as the relationship. So further investigation is needed to determine if this was an anomalous year or if something else might be going on here. Also note that the highest record or recorded number for 2023 was 41, and in 2022, the highest uh, reading recorded was 199. Therefore, the scales are different for that reason. Next slide. And so the next steps into uh, looking further into this data is by analyzing the microcystin toxin results to see if there's a pattern of occurrence, um, how often dilutions were being performed, if there has been an increase over the years, and to better define those thresholds, looking at frequency of toxin occurrence in tested samples for microcystin and to investigate any correlations with phycocyanin and readings with more historical data, um, incorporating more telemetry buoy data, and at some point wrangling the fl flyover results into these analyses as well. Um, other valuable data resources could also contribute to a future predictive model, but may also help to explain decreases in assemblages or changes in patterns by incorporating weather data, tracking the application of certain management applications like algaecide treatments, lowering lake info, flow rate information, etc. So, as well as identifying any monitoring gaps within the lakes monitoring program data or provide recommendations on parameters or other sampling that should be conducted. Um, further investigation um, in the comparison of phycocyanin readings across all equipment and looking at toxin production frequency and related to phycocyanin uh, readings overall. Um, looking into other enumeration methods to see if there's a stronger relationship or correlation um, with phycocyanin readings in order to further improve our strategy. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> so in recent 
in recent years, there's been a study that came out in April of 2023. And this research was focused on creating a framework framework that would help guide management of uh, HABs and toxin public health advisories at a lake in Arkansas. So using thresholds and regressions between total microcystin concentrations, chlorophyll and phycocyanin, as well as fluorescence. Pigment concentrations all showed significant thresholds and total microcystin concentrations as well, showing that concentrations increased above the thresholds that the toxin microcystin was greater at this lake. The microcystin levels were greatest when water samples had met this criteria, which provides a potential framework for lake managers to advise an elevated risk for toxins. So utilizing ratio ranges of phycocyanin to chlorophyll um, may be providing a potential may be providing a potential framework for lake managers to advise when to implement um, advisories in the future. And that's it. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, we're going to just ask that you put any questions for Emily in the chat to move this afternoon along. I'm going to now move to Dr. Lori Lester with the Division of Science and Research. Um, and she's going to be talking about more numbers. All right, you're good to go. Except you're muted. <laughs> oh, you guys actually want to hear what I'm talking about today, don't you? <laughs> Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Chelsea. I appreciate it. So as Chelsea said, I'm here today to talk about a project that we did at DSR for how to estimate the probability of exceeding the microsystem threshold using the cell count data. And so I didn't work on this alone. I worked on it in collaboration with Rob Newby and Alex Polliser. Um, so just so you are aware. So this is an update to a report that we wrote back in 2020. Um, so our main point was just to determine whether we could use the you know, two metrics to determine the likelihood of the microcystin toxin exceeding the recreational advisory threshold, which is two micrograms per liter. And we wanted to know if we could figure that out using just the cyanobacteria cell count data. So what we did is we used all of the data in the freshwater HAB database. We used all the data that was available at the time that we ran these statistics. So it was through September of 2022. We looked at only two metrics, so it was a really simple model. We just looked at the microcystin concentrations and microgram per liter, and we looked at the cyanobacteria cell counts. The first thing that we did was that we estimated summary statistics for various scenarios of the data set. So we looked, we calculated arithmetic means, which are just your basic average. We also calculated standard deviations and standard errors just to get some idea of the variability in those averages that we were calculating. And we also calculated select percentiles. So zero is your minimum, 100 is your maximum, 50 is your median, and then those other percentiles that are listed on the slide. We did this for different scenarios of the, is there a question? I see a hand up. Are we holding questions till the end? Okay. Yeah, the hand the hand went down. Um, okay. We can save questions till till the end. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So as I was saying, we calculated these summary statistics for different scenarios. So we did it for the whole data set, but then we also pulled out five separate lakes to look at independently. So those five lakes were Lake Patacon, Greenwood Lake, Spruce Run, Swartzwood Lake, and Manigasquan. And then we also ran the summary statistics looking at different microcystin concentrations. So we ran them when it was under the threshold, so less than two micrograms per liter, and then we ran them separately for those samples that were over the threshold, so greater than or equal to two micrograms per liter. After we did all of those summary statistics, we also decided to do use a logistic regression. And the reason logistic regressions are not scary, they're very similar to your basic linear regression that you'll probably remember with your y equals mx plus, plus b. 
The only difference is that you use them to model the likelihood of an event occurring where there's only two possible outcomes. So, you know, your zeros and ones, or your yes versus no's, or in our case, your yes, I exceeded, no, I did not exceed the threshold. So basically, all we were using this equation to do was to determine what is the probability of microcystin exceeding the threshold at the various cell counts per milliliter. And so we did this analysis in program R using the equation that you see on your screen. The P on the left side of that equation is the response variable. So that's just the probability of microsystem exceeding the threshold. And the predictor variable on the right-hand side of that equation, the X is your cell counts per milliliter. So basically the goal of using these, this equation was just to create a very simple table where we have our probabilities on one side. So our probability of exceeding the threshold on one side and we have our cell counts on the other. So we were attempting to calculate the probability of exceedance for cell counts of 10,000, 25,000 and 80,000. And then we were also looking at additional probabilities that were higher than the probabilities estimated for these cell counts. So we were looking at those for 25, 50, and 75%. And once again, we did this on different subsets of the data, but the subsets were slightly different than what we did for the summary statistics. So for these, for the logistic regressions, we looked at the full data set, of course, we looked at a subset that only looked at cell counts within different ranges, so between 10,000 to 500,000 or 10,000 to 250,000. And then we did those same first three subsets, but we did them using the whole data set but minus Lake Hepaticong. And the reason why we did that was because Lake Hepaticong made up a large number of samples in the data set. So these are the five lakes that I mentioned earlier. These are the ones that we looked at independently. Just so you're aware, we chose these because they all experience frequent blooms and they all had a sample size available that was greater than 100. So just so you know, that's why we represented some lakes and not others. Um, and also I will not be presenting these results unfortunately today because of time, but if you're interested in seeing them, just shoot me an email. My email is on the final slide of this presentation. So here's what the results looked like for the summary statistics. The table that you're looking at, I'm sorry it's so small, I hate when people share tables this small, but it's hard in 10 minute talks. This table, the top half is showing you the summary statistics for the cell counts, and the bottom half is showing you the summary statistics for the microsystem. You have all those different subsets that we talked about, so the full data set, the five lakes, and the whether you're exceeding the threshold or not subsets. The N is your sample size. The mean is that arithmetic average that we talked about earlier, standard deviation, standard error, and then all your percentiles are listed here. And one thing that stood out to us from this table was that the microsystem concentrations and cell counts per milliliter tended to be higher in Greenwood Lake than the other water bodies. So let's move on to talking about the logistic regressions. What we found from the logistic regressions was that the probability of exceeding the threshold did significantly increase as the cell count per milliliter increased. So we pretty much expected that. If your cell count's higher, your probability of exceeding the threshold is also going to be higher. However, our R squared values are very low, which you can see on here. If you remember back to your statistics course back in high school or college, an R squared value that is pretty good would be close to one, and these are all very, very low. So what that means for us is that the variability in the system, a lot of it was not explained by cell counts alone. So it would be advantageous to add some other variables to these models. And then here's an example of the type of results we had where we were actually looking at the various probabilities of exceeding the threshold and where we estimated them. So this is that table I was talking about where we estimated the probability of exceedance for these different subsets of the data with the cell counts 10,000, 25,000, and 80,000. And you'll see for these three subsets that are presented on this slide, the probability of exceedance is pretty low. So, you know, for the full data set, it was around 11.8%. That was your probability of exceeding the microsystem threshold at 10,000 to 80,000 cell counts. And then you'll see, you know, it gets a lot higher as you go to that ad those additional probabilities of 25, 50, and 75%.
So one caveat I did want to mention about this analysis was that a lot of the samples were, were collected from northern New Jersey. 40% um, were from just Lake Capaticon and Greenwood Lake. An additional 19% were from those other three water bodies that we looked at, Spruce Run, Swartzwood, and Manat Casquan. So the results may not be appropriate to assume for the entire state, particularly southern Jersey. So the basic takeaway from this analysis was that we are able to predict the probability of exceeding the microsystem threshold using the cell count. However, there is a lot of variability in these calculations and the R squared values were very low, so they could be greatly improved by adding other environmental parameters such as temperature, salinity, DO, et cetera. And another takeaway was just that as more samples are collected, especially in southern New Jersey, it may be worthwhile to rerun the analysis to see if there's differences in the different regions. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lori. Any quick questions for Emily or Lori? Like one or two? Okay. Feel free to just put them in the chat. Uh, if not, I'm going to reintroduce our watershed coordinator, Bob Schuster, again, who's going to talk about watershed decision making tools that are currently under development. Bob? All right, well, now we'll really take time for questions. If anybody <laughs> wants to ask Emily or Lori a question while Bob gets settled. Anyone? Make sure really quickly, Bob. Not having any issues. There you go. All right. Yeah, just, hey, how's everybody doing? Got on just All in right. time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so you are up. Hopefully our screen sharing issues are over. There you go. All right, th thanks for having me again. Um, I'm going to be talking about some hotspot analysis today. Um, it, it, it's something we're starting to use more of, and it's utilizing the existing data we have. Um, one thing, it was mentioned earlier in the morning, you know, when you go to the National Water Quality Portal and you look at all of the data that's in there, looking at the number of sites, you know, for all water bodies, you know, between 2000 and 2022, New Jersey has collected over 13,000 sites, um, you know, at some point during that time frame. So that's a lot of information that's out there. Um, we all use this for, for routine work, you know, determine water quality for its impairments for its uses. We, we use it to protect public health. We use it to protect ecosystem health and develop standards. Um, we also use it, you know, to, to what do we, how, how can we use it to improve water quality, where the problems are, addressing point and non-point sources, because our ultimate goal is all the Clean Water Act, you know, in the end. So we have HABs. And, and part of what we're looking at are nutrients, but those nutrients are causing a lot of other issues for a lot of other uses. So there's an overlap. Um, there's a lot of things that go on. You could develop TMDLs, total maximum daily loads. There's a lot of, it gets used in permitting from, from MS4 permits we heard earlier today, um, the GIPTES permits um, for, for po other point sources. Um, it's using, there, there's grants and watershed based plans are out there to take actions. And there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of new things coming out, watershed improvement plans as part of MS4, watershed based plans. So it's an ongoing issue. We have a lot of these in areas. It's what do we do with all that information that we have? Um, so, and how it all ties in, and I'll be going through an example today. Um, so one of the things is a lot of the times we have all this data, how do we use it to 
say, where do we go take the actions that for improvement? Can this data help guide us where we should prioritize? Not that everywhere is not important, but there might be errors we want to start first. And how do we utilize that existing data? The data might also show us that we have existing gaps, maybe in coverage, but also in how often you collect it. Um, may, maybe we don't have data for the last five years in an area that maybe maybe we need to go back and revisit. Um, so what I'd like to do with this first part in these examples is how do we start taking this data, rolling it out, utilizing it? Um, I'm looking at assisting people in the Atlantic coast as we're in that current cycle right now of and partnering at bay with TMDL potential rollout by the end of the year. How, how do we utilize this to make decisions? So I've looked at some data and I've looked at other data around the state. Um, so it, it really helps to identify, you know, what issues are going on and, and then how do you monitor that effectiveness when you do take actions? So the, it, it helps us evaluate a lot of our processes. So, so it's something that I think is important and it, with all that wealth of data, how do we utilize it? I'm gonna talk about some tools that are being developed. We're developing a Watershed New Jersey tool. Many people that, that I see on this meeting have been part of the early stakeholdering. Um, we're gonna be doing more stakeholdering as we're rolling it out. And this is to take different types of land, different types of layers and say, let's do a watershed health assessment. What is what is the impervious cover? What is the infrastructure? What is the land use? What are wetlands? What do riparian look like? So there's a lot of layers that are being rolled in um, to, to characterize these watersheds on, on a large scale. Um, we're also gonna be linking that with, you know, the outcome of the integrated report of where we have water quality impairments. And, and one of the outcomes is going to be a, a tool that will help, you know, look for remediation opportunity tool. Where, where, where do you go look? Um, hotspot analysis and talk today is something that we're going to like to roll into that down the road. There's also a tool to help um, municipalities that is that is out. It's going to be a web-based tool that's going to help, you know, develop the watershed improvement plans and start those requirements. The hotspot analysis, I'm going to show some examples today. We want to automate this process going down the road because there, there's a lot of things that could be automated that could help us all going forward and in the future. And it's really to identify those areas of concern by pulling all of that data over a longer time frame out of the water quality portal. Um, and then we want to compare it to all different types of factors. We heard today, climate, what is going on with air temperatures, water temperature, stream flow, wet, dry conditions. Um, so to that end, I will go through just an example. This would be, I threw in thresholds of, this is all of the lakes data that was in the portal that I found from 2000 through 2022. Um, there, this is color coded for mean total phosphorus. If it's red, the average is above the 0.05. If it's green, it's below the 0.05 on average. This is just a depiction of how you can see what the state looks like overall based on data that was in that time frame. You know, zooming in on a couple areas, you could see Lake Apakong off on one side. You could see Cranberry Lake off on, off to the left. And there's data in those, and these are means. And I think what's interesting when you look at the mid lake mean, the mid lake mean was looking, it didn't separate out, which we can in the database, the surface versus bottom. It was a combination of both. And when you really go in and look at the, the raw data, a lot of this is driven by that deep water station where that phosphorus is higher in the bottom waters. Um, this was just an example for what you can look at overall on a mean. There are other things that we'd like to automate in this process of, you know, what thresholds can we make it available where people can put in different thresholds and map their areas or map the, the you know, what it looks like for their area of concern. Another thing that I wanted to do said, let's look at percentage of results that exceed 0.05 milligrams per liter. And you get a slightly different picture. The mid lake, you could see basically color coding, anything that's green is less than 20% of the results that were available. Um, yellow is 20 to 40%. Red would actually be 40 to 60% of the results were exceeding, 
you know, that that 0.05. Um, you could also see those purple and black colors at Cranberry Lake. Th those darker colors in the black is actually over 80 percent exceed are greater than 0.05. Um, so the mean tells you one picture looking at how much how to build in these automated tools to look at it a little different. Ch just to go on, I wanted to look at, say, let's look at another, you, you know, nitrate, for example. This, the thresholds that I used for this mapping, just as an example, would be, I, I went and used uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, had some different criteria lined up for, for trophic status of lakes. Um, the green is less than 0.3. Um, then you go to yellow, which is greater than the 0 0.5. So, so what's let is 0.3 to 0.5, and then you will go up from there. Um, but you can see overall the mean, you know, you're, you're below that, that 0.3 threshold of 0.3 milligram per liter that they use in that location. But again, if you want present a results greater than 0.3, you start to see a different picture. You start to see there's areas that have these intermittent higher fluxes of those nutrients coming in at various times. So how do we use these tools? You can see in Lake Apakong with nitrate, you start to see things in Woodport Bay and up in the north, but also, at the same time, you're seeing that Crescent Cove River sticks, which you also see in total phosphorus with those intermittent, intermittent spikes. What, what you can do with this, how do we overlay this with all of these other tools? These are the, these are the mapping of, say, all stormwater outfalls that are along these areas. And even you could see them around that Cranberry Lake area where you had higher levels. So this is just not that that's what's causing all of the problem, but it's an example of how if we mesh all of these together as tools, we, we can make the decision-making process a lot easier. I'm looking at this area, you can see right in that part, you, you know, you get the river sticks area where we had those both high levels. There's a lot of them in a very small confined in, embayment area, but you could also see where we had those higher nitrate up in the north, there they were happen to be clustered by where a lot of these outfalls were. So it's just something that could be a tool to help. What what can you look at going forward? Because taking the river sticks data and looking at just the data itself and sorting it from high to low, say for nitrate, where we had those, those spikes up in river sticks, you could see there are certain dates that there are more elevated levels, and you could see 521 back in 14, 52 and 17, 10, 13, all the way back to 2011. How do we take this data and now say, what else does it tell us? The DEP, we've had this um, rainfall website for a while now. There's ways to, that we've internally linked it to the data, I would like to do that across the board for the statewide, have the nearest station linked to all of the data. Um, because when I zoomed in and went to a station that was near the Hapakong, those higher levels, this is what happened before sampling on those higher levels. The, the May 25th, you could see we had precipitation events that preceded the, those inputs. You go to the next one, preceding by a few hours, not as much, much rain, but this is actually on the day of sampling, probably not too far prior to the time the sample was collected. So when we link it automatically, we can link it down to one, three, four, all the different hours and where it, it automatically was, you know, how it linked in duration of the rain event and whether it was multiple days or one day or close to the sampling event, because that tells you something about what the sources may be because they're reacting quick or they're reacting slow. Um, and then you went to the third highest result. And again, we we happen to have some results that fell prior to, to a lot of the sampling. Um, so it wasn't a lot of rain, but with a lot of outfalls, could that be part of what you're looking at? Um, so the object is to take those tools, mess them all together, because we, if we can focus on the areas we're seeing those hotspots and find out how to remediate those areas, it's something that will inform us on what we might to do in other areas coming in from the watershed. Um,
So looking at any tributary flow, river flow that might be feeding into it would be something that you could link to. So we have a large amount of data in there. It, 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 it can be utilized in a lot of different ways. And this is just the start. And the object would be to make it a tool that we could we, we could automate link and, and you could select different time frames and different links. Um, but also overlaying that with all of the other components that we need of that those watershed components of stormwater outfall, stormwater infrastructure, land use, land cover, impervious cover, and all of those different tools all in one spot will we'll make it a, a much better, more robust way to get science-driven decision-making on, on the data that we're seeing. Um, so with that, I'll end and any any questions or comments, I really want to work with people on this to, to get as much as we can done to, to make something like this happen and certainly have recommendations on how we can always make it better. Thanks, Bob. It's good stuff coming. All right, does anybody have any questions for Bob? Or Lori or Emily, since we kind of rushed through those parts. Q&A? Nope. All right, with that, I'm going to introduce our Assistant Commissioner, Pat Gardner from Water Resource Management, here to close out the day. Um, thanks. I'm not sure there's anything I could add to all the information that was discussed today. And I was able to jump in and out a few times. Um, so I was happy for the, the opportunity. And I also was following the chat, which was quite active during the entire day. but. I really want to thank all of you for attending the Have Summit, especially the presenters and also our DEP staff and others who put this together. Um, it's not a simple thing to do. You can ask Chelsea. Um, and uh, so I had to hear some stories over the last few weeks, but I think everything seemed to have come together very nicely. Um, you know, but seriously, we have seen an increase in HAB occurrences, and much of it could be attributed to climate change. They become more numerous. Uh, more intense, toxic, and they seem to last longer. As some of the presenters um, today talked about, in addition to in addition to increased occurrence, we now face new challenges. You know, last year, last few years, we have drinking water as well as groundwater wells. So, using a forward-thinking, anticipatory approach, DP and our partners continue to overcome these challenges through an enhanced monitoring, like including the satellite imagery, flyover data and response and research, some of the statistical analysis. I think when Lori was mentioning that the, the method they used was not too scary, I think she was directing that comment at me um, because I've had, I have had to work with Lori on several statistical analysis and I'm always a little bit leery until I am told to trust the process, which I do, and everything seems to, to come out the way it's supposed to, so that's good. You guys, you continue to do research you, using the newest advanced technology. There was even a presentation today on AI, which, which I found fascinating. The collaboration is obvious through all of you and also in our limited ability to provide grants to help communities to prevent HABs. Many of the presentations and discussions today revolved around taking initiative and preparing for the future rather than mere, merely reacting to the events as they unfold. And it also highlights the importance of taking a comprehensive look at managing the resource as a whole. This half season, I'm not as afraid as I was last half season. So every year I struggle, you know, wondering like what's going to happen next. But I've seen over and over again the ability of our own team and DEP, as well as our partners at the utilities and the science, other folks out there, the watershed to come together and actually work through some of these difficult problems. Um, and come up with a solution at least takes care of it for the moment and may not take care of it forever. Um, and I'm very happy to see that the guidance is coming out for lake communities and I'm encouraging, um, you know, the, um, the public and private lake managers to attend that training. Also maybe consider having your community officials attend the training, share the information with your own community because for me, public education it's just key to this whole issue. And we saw that in Cozy Lake. Um, there was, you know, it took a lot and we still were working with those folks there to try to understand the impact of drawing your drinking water from a lake. Um, and, and also the ability to understand the need to, to check your private wells, have it tested, like all that kind of stuff. It's not something that people think about on a daily basis. 
Um, I appreciate all the information, input, and questions you all raised today. And uh, land, uh, you know, our water is worth it. So, and it'll take all of us to collaborate um, to solve or even come close to solving the HAB issue and all the other water quality issues that we face on a daily basis. So again, I thank you all for coming and um, have a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And as somebody did ask previously about the slides being shared, we are at this summit was recorded, though in many chunks due to our technical difficulties, but our geniuses at IT are going to weave it together for us and we will be posting that um, in the coming weeks. So thanks again and we'll see you next year. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.